Okay, so good morning everybody. <laughs> I'm happy to see you here after the last night dinner. So you'd enjoy it and you had the strength to come. Um, well, now let me introduce you the keynote speaker for today, which is Do Dr. Martin, K Martin Kralinger, sorry, uh, which is currently the leader of the uh, Natural Language Processing for Biomedical Information Analysis Unit at the Barcelona Com Supercomputing Center. And it's also the former head of the Biomedical Text Mining Unit at the Spanish National uh, Cancer Research Center. He has been working with natural language processing since uh, 15 years, over, over 15 years, and he published also more than 90 papers on the subject. And uh, he was involved in organized several high uh, impact evaluation and benchmarking efforts, including the BioCreative or the ELCELEF and others. So please let me leave the floor to Dr. Martin Kralinger. So, uh, thanks a lot um, for inviting me, and I really would, you know, give my big thanks to the organizers for having me here, and also to the audience. Like the talks, the last days were really amazing and very enriching. Also for people working in NLP to see what is being done in, in other kind of data processing uh, applications like imaging or dealing with structured data. So it was very really enriching. Thanks a lot, and. Um, I appreciate really to, to have me here. Um, so my talk will be related to some of the uh, issues we are facing in the development of natural language processing applications applied to the biomedical field and also in particular to clinical data. Um, and um, to go beyond uh, what is being done currently, I also would like to raise some of the issues in uh, terms of developing multilingual tools going beyond monolingual applications, applications focusing on, on data in English and what we're going, you know, what we're doing at, at my group and also other groups uh, towards the implementation of multilingual natural language processing applications applied to the clinical field. Um, I will start giving, you know, uh, thanks to my team. I usually do that in the end, but I want to, wanted to highlight that it's a highly interdisciplinary team with three clinicians with AI researchers, experts in NLP, computational linguistics, and more software engineering. So I really think that um, to build efficient uh, clinical NLP applications, you need to have a team also including clinicians, not only experts in natural language processing. Especially because the data is really very complex and you need direct feedback and input at the various stages of the design of these applications. Um, I'll provide some background. So I think we had some talks in the in the conference related to NLP, clinical NLP, for instance, there was a talk uh, applying clinical NLP to data in Spanish, data in Brazilian, also Chinese. So I really think it's very exciting to see this very uh, multilingual application scenario also in, in, in this venue. Uh, but still, as many of the uh, people in the audience, they might focus on other kind of data, like imaging or structured data, I wanted to raise awareness about the importance of processing textual data, clinical data. So we all know that um, most of the clinical available data currently is unstructured data, uh, which mainly includes imaging and also textual data. And I would say for imaging, uh, lots of things have been done so far, but still the clinical textual data, which is the data the clinician is actually uh, generating or the healthcare providers is generating, and which has valuable descriptions on the patient information, is still somehow mainly unlocked and underexplored in terms of the um, clinical uh, data mining applications. And if you look at uh, publications, there were some research on, on, on this topic. Even though people are claiming they use electronic health record for doing data, uh, clinical data mining, basically only like 5% of them are really looking into the clinical narratives. And most of these techniques still are using quite, let's say, ancient techniques based on rules, based on dictionaries or pattern matching. So there's still, if you look at the general domain clinical, uh, general domain NLP applications, where we all know there are soft, soft, sophisticated language models and deep learning uh, being used in the clinical NLP field, I think there's a lot of room of improvements and, and um, advancements to be achieved uh, yet so far. We all know also that the uh, textual data of the clinical records 
do have a very high impact for various applications from uh, patient uh, stratification, classification, predictive modeling, uh, also like just for structuring the data. There's a lot of, of practical application of the clinical records. And I also wanted to uh, highlight that it's not only the electronic health record which matters. If you want to have a more comprehensive view on patient health and population health, there are also other data sources which are of uh, um, uttermost importance, such as the biomedical literature, so more like the basic research and the molecular aspects, or even animal model uh, information. But there are also like scientific uh, um, clinical trials. There's the, the, the web data, the biomedical web, and if you look at the uh, language, large language models, they are also used and they get like ba basically data sources from from doing web uh, web mining or web content. But the people are also working on, on social media mining, and we had some talk on, on social media uh, and, and mental health as well. Patient forum, patent data, if you're going into more like competitive intelligence applications, blogs, and so on. So to get more comprehensive view on, on patient information, even like pa patient-generated content or user-generated content, one needs to look at, you know, at the whole picture and also see what's the connection or how you could actually integrate uh, various data sources. Um, and obviously there's a lot of data in each of these. Uh, basically, just for those which are not really familiar with NLP, the, the aim of people doing research in clinical NLP is to extract information, understand, interpret, and basically process human language, in this case uh, healthcare provider, scientific uh, um, biomedical language, uh, in, in textual form. Um, I also wanted to raise a little awareness about going beyond English. So um, there's a lot of research being done in clinical NLP in English. There are data available, such as the MIMIC uh, corpus of clinical records. But um, the mo most of the patients worldwide, they don't have their data, the clinical data in English. My clinical record is, uh, is in Spanish. And I would say also many of the, the people in the audience, if they look at their own healthcare data, uh, most of it is not in English. So we really, really need to go beyond that and push as a community towards developing either tools for each of these other languages, because they all have variable, uh, available data sources, or directly also uh, go towards the generation of multilingual clinical NLP applications. We know, all of uh, us know ChatGPT, it is a big su success also because it is a multilingual application. So we really need to go beyond doing NLP in, clinical, in the clinical field using all the same data set and all in English. Um, just like to highlight, um, like if you look at the Spanish clinical content, there are over 570 million people which are potentially also patients and in, they also include healthcare professionals which uh, might, you know, or could uh, provide clinical content uh, in Spanish, and if we go beyond that, look at the Romance languages, including Italian and Portuguese and French, and where multilingual application could be easily adapted across these different languages. There were 900 million people spe speaking Romance languages, so I really would um, try to push towards uh, bridging, you know, uh, the gap between resources which, which are being developed for clinical NLP in English to the other languages which provide variable uh, content, especially for some of the application scenarios such as rare diseases where you really need to go beyond uh, what is available for English. So um, clinical NLP is very difficult. You all you have read, or many of you have read your clinical record. It is a very complex uh, type of uh, textual data. It contains a lot of very technical medical terminologies. So it can be up to 28% of technical medical terms when you read some of these um, cl clinical reports. It does have, in some of the, especially in some of the languages, lots of English expressions, so it's somehow even maybe multilingual. Uh, it has many new terms being introduced. If you look at the COVID, literature, uh, COVID clinical records, they were publishing and they were describing things which were not observed before, so it's a rapid, rapidly changing type of textual data, uh, so you need to accommodate also for these rapidly changing content types. Uh, it is very like telegraphic, it contains many abbreviations, acronyms, it's highly ambiguous. Clinicians usually don't have much time, especially when they're writing clinical course or they're work, uh, working in emergency departments, so it is, has lots of ungrammatical expressions, um, uh, 
basically sentences which lack punctuation marks, accents in some of these languages. So it's a difficult type of content. But still also it, it is very redundant in some of these cases. So some, many of these kind of clinical records have a high degree of redundancy. They're repeating the, main, this, the same things because some of the patients share similar characteristics, but they also do a lot of cut and paste. So when, they, when you look at these records, they're, they're difficult, but they also have uh, some sort of, let's say, low-hanging fruits in terms of the redundancy and recurrency of, of, of the information. Uh, and it's, it's obviously very variable also, because if you look at data from one hospital to the other, the application needs to be adapted. If you look at one type of clinical record, like a discharge summary, to another one, like rad radiology report, these systems need to be adapted. And also, uh, obviously, um, depending on the speciality, it's not the same thing to process ophthalmology data than, uh, than uh, oncology. So these kind of tools need to be really flexible or the approach or the pipeline you're implementing needs to accommodate uh, towards these changes in language, the changes or difference variances uh, in terms of the type of record, even with differences between hospitals. So there's no like um, scenario where one NLP application can be built out of the box and you pretend it will work very well for all kinds of uh, data and all kinds of hospitals. And I will show you some of the strategies we are implementing in the context of European projects to deal with this variability and the adaptation process of the applications. So I also wanted to, to mention that many of these resources, especially the annotated data, which I will show you later on, they were uh, generated in the context of a strategic national, national uh, plan for for the advancement of language technologies in Spain. So there was a um, strategic plan promoted by the Ministry of Economy to generate what they call uh, linguistic infrastructure. So you need annotated data set and, and development of partic particular components, including large language models, to actually um, boost the development by the community, both in academia as well as in, in, in the, in, for the industry, for the commercial applications. And in the context of this uh, national strategic plan, we collaborated with hospitals, with the uh, National Medical Library in Spain, the uh, aid, um, medical agency, and some other uh, scientific institutions to build annotated data set, uh, um, labeled uh, uh, content, uh, terminological resources. So we all know that ontologies and uh, structured vocabulary is key for structuring data and for processing data and, and to make it more interoperable. Uh, we also were working on this topic, very specific components to process clinical content. And we also were organizing, and we'll um, come back to that later on, what we call shared task or relation campaigns. So basically competitive uh, tasks in uh, academic venues to boost the development of uh, components by the community, but also to evaluate the quality of these systems. So spe uh, specifically in clinical NLP and clinical application, we really, really not need to um, know what's the quality of these components and the quality will change over time as technology improves, or, uh, improves as well. Um, so what are actually the driving forces behind the development of these kind of uh, resources in, in, the, in, the, in the clinical NLP community? Obviously the access to data is key and we all know this is not trivial for data uh, which patient data, which, which basically has a, a legal um, restriction in terms of data privacy and, and, and data uh, access. So this is very difficult to achieve and I will show some uh, uh, results we are, or some resources we were able to, to release for Spanish. Uh, you need software, there's a lot of software and libraries and, 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 and even um, platforms for, uh, for integrating different components uh, in the scenario of clinical NLP. And what has been key in terms of boosting the development of uh, resources in clinical NLP are shared tasks, uh, community evaluation campaigns. And there's one focusing on data in English, which is basically the I2B2, now called N2C2. There are several shared tasks at CLEF, uh, at TRAC, and we also were collaborating with a community effort called BioCreative to evaluate this. Just to mention in Italy, you also have a um, uh, evaluation um, initiative called Evalita, which is promoted by the clinical, uh, by the NLP community in Italian. So, and they also have this year uh, a, a track on, on processing uh, uh, clinical content in Italian. Um, another issue, and I, th I would 
I, I think this is not really solved, although people are talking a lot about that, is uh, how, what's the, re the, the legal scenario in accessing clinical content by the research community or by the developer community. In the US, I think it's a little better defined what are the kind of information which are sensitive, which, are to be, which is considered to be a sensitive information. In the European framework, I would say this is more like a general legal definition. But if you go back to you know, the reality and, and they ask you, you know, what, what is, you know, is the data anonymized or how do you anonymize the data? It's not very well defined, and you always struggle with, you know, what is the kind of information you need to uh, mask or you need to uh, resynthesize and to make sure that the data is anonymized. So I think that there's room to, you know, to improve that kind of more concrete technical scenario on defining you know, how to access the data and how to generate actually the identified anonymized data. Uh, I would say also the driving forces nowadays include, and I think this is like more the later part, the access to large language models or pre-trained language models uh, adapted also to clinical uh, or to biomedical language. And there are quite a lot of language models already um, um, being generated, for instance, for English. You have CleanBird, you have quite a lot of different PubMedBird, um, they're, they're quite a large number of models. and. There are also models being uh, adapted to clinical to the clinical domain in other languages. So there are some for, for Spanish, and I'll show you later on. There's an initiative to generate a clinical language model for Italian. There's one for uh, for for Dutch. Another one also for Swedish. Uh, so there's a, like an ongoing effort to generate these language models actually adapted to the clinical language as well, or the biomedical language. And uh, I would say also that uh, one of the um, let's say, uh, efforts now is not only to work on basic research in NLP, but also to generate resources which can be connected directly to the clinical needs, to clinical use cases, uh, which in the beginning was more like not, not, that, of, not, not that important for the researchers in, 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 in NLP and the computational linguistics, but if you want to have an impact, you need to also align with use cases of impact in the clinical um, scenarios. So um, I'm trying to sell a lot of you know, why NLP is very important. And I think also um, uh, one needs to look at the different applications. So applications of NLP, and I, th I think ChatGPT actually was, um, it's, let's say, it, uh, good for people working in NLP, but also bad, because it's, you never know exactly you know, what, what is the role of generative language models for some of these applications we're working on. on on, in, in, in the field of uh, clinical NLP beyond data augmentation. So there's still some, some let's say, a question mark there. But uh, if you look at the application, they range from generating terminologies and ontologies directly from textual content, improving information access by more advanced semantic search and, uh, sem and text uh, indexing applications, um, semantic annotation, or, or basically named entity recognition, extracting automatically very complex clinical uh, attributes such as diseases, symptoms, medications directly from text, um, and linking them or normalizing them, mapping them to control vocabularies and ontologies, with what we call entity linking. Obviously, you know, machine translation, people are working on domain adaptation and evaluation of machine translation for medical language. The clinical language is quite different from common language, so you need an adaptation there as well. And then you have all kinds of other applications which uh, deal with you know, um, unsupervised applications and text similarity, text clustering, relation extraction, topic modeling, and so forth. So there are quite a lot of different applications which are important also for the clinical field. Um, Often when you're working on a project in, in which uh, deals with applying clinical NLP in a more like multimodal or, um, or use case oriented um, scenario, what people usually ask, ask you to do is just structuring the data. You have the unstructured data and provide me the list of SNOMED CT IDs, ICD-10 codes, or basically some modifiers if it's negated or affirmed. So obviously also, um, Clinical NLP is key to provide information for predictive modeling or for data analytics. And in this, in this uh, case, it's more like structuring data with uh, control vocabularies. Um, I've mentioned uh, previously the language models, pre language models and large uh, language models. So there's um, uh, basically a huge effort uh, also in terms of uh, computational uh, um, power to generate and release large language models, pre-trained language models for, 
for um, general domain uh, languages, but also for multi uh, multilingual scenarios and adaptation to to the clinical field. And these uh, language models do have a huge impact. Just picking one of them, like the uh, clinical bird, they have m almost half a million downloads each uh, in the, the last month. And if you look at other l uh, language models, they also have you know a very huge uh, com um, consumer community behind them. Also in the commercial field, not only in academia. So there's a huge effort, and these these are key resources to improve later on the fine tuning for very specific tasks. In the BC, obviously, uh, being in a, we are basically the Spanish uh, supercomputer uh, um, research center. We also um, uh, European infrastructure offering uh, computational capacities for the European researchers. Um, and we are also now building one of the three uh, top um, um, computational infrastructures in Europe. There's, there will be one in Italy and there's one also in Finland. So we are also working on generating uh, language models uh, for general domain in, in Spanish and also for Catalan and, and uh, also uh, domain specific uh, models for basically for the biomedical field. Um, if you look at the general, you know, uh, let's say a very prototypical pipeline on how people work in this field, obviously you need to do some pre-processing, gather the data, large data collections. So usually there's one step on training, doing this pre-training of the, the language model and then transfer learning, adapting them to particular downstream tasks such as recognizing clinical concepts, relation extraction, text classification, or um, machine translation. And then usually you need to apply also some post-processing because it, the, the type of information you're dealing with is, is usually very complex and everything can be modeled by, by supervised approaches. Um, then, I mean, uh, also looking at the uh, biomedical NLP applications, I already mentioned this uh, issues and in terms of the type of input data so you need you need to characterize very well the type of information you're um, processing in terms of the clinical record uh, variability you need to deal with the privacy issues so usually you need to make sure that either the processing is being done in-house meaning at the clinical site or that at least a sample of the data is uh, being uh, anonymized or de-identified and the third strategy, which is getting more popular nowadays, is also to generate synthetic data collections to mimic or to serve as a surrogate to the real clinical records. Um, the connection to the medical needs is usually very difficult. And uh, I would say the common setting here is that clinical uh, experts that define some predefined variables. I want and need this symptom, this, this, this comorbidity, these medic medications. But in practice, usually this is very, let's say, um, a not very data-driven approach, meaning that you, during these projects, you, they usually uh, change the variables and, and just see that some of them are actually not really relevant for predictive modeling or for the use cases, and then that the process is very dynamic. And here, I think like uh, NLP offers a much more, let's say, data-driven, robust solution. You extract all the variables, and then later on, the clinician should actually pick what is more relevant and predefining this small set of variables. Uh, another, let's say, issue here is uh, you need to integrate these results in a more robust way. So you need to make them interoperable in terms in this case, semantically with, with other resources, which in our case usually means to do mapping or association to uh, control vocabularies and structure terminologies or classification schemas. So ICD-10 or SNOMED CT are, like, let's say, the, the most prevalent resources for doing, of assuring the interoperability and data integration. Uh, and uh, here, I think uh, one key aspect is also to, to have the, the clinical experts in the loop to actually refine this, the, the, all of these steps somehow. So um, just like as a comparative scenario, what do you have for, for English? There are, uh, I think, very valuable resources such as the MIMIC data set, of, um, if, which is uh, released in PhysioNet. There are some scientific publications. If you do more like biomedical or basic research mining, obviously the data source is mainly in English. So you don't need to worry about, or not that much, uh, about adapting your resource beyond English. There are quite a lot of annotated corpora and data sets already available, um, and there are huge collections of ontologies and, and control vocabularies. UMLS is, has been mentioned in some of the talks. 
there are um, the, on the open uh, ontology foundry there are quite a lot of different ontologies capturing the domain knowledge for different uh, um, application scenarios in the biomedical field uh, beyond english um, there's quite some effort also to do a Chi uh, nlp a clinical nlp in chinese but beyond english one needs to face the reality there's a lack of large uh, clinical corpora and especially in Europe with the um, data protection scenario it's very difficult to actually generate these data collections. There are scientific uh, publications more from the medical community so like uh, there's a huge medical community uh, publishing also in Spanish and their databases you know PubMed but there also are databases specifically focusing on content in Spanish and English such as Yellow um, and also like there's there are medical clinical publications in Italian but obviously they're directly targeted towards the medical community speaking this language. There are really very few annotated labeled data resources and it needs to be pushed. You know, in, if you don't have high quality an annotated data sources, there's no way to, you, you can actually uh, implement more sof sophisticated supervised machine learning techniques. And although there are efforts to generate multilingual terminology, SOMAT captures quite a lot. You have mesh terms also in multiple languages. Uh, Medra is, publishes also the content in multiple languages and, and you know, these are being um, highly used. There's still a lack of um, multilingual terminologies and some of the languages they, they lack even very basic terminologies. We are dealing with a project with content also in Romanian and in Czech and basically there's no SNOMAD resource. There are basically no you know, um, useful medical terminologies which you could use as a, as a, as a starting point. So you also need to see what a machine translation, biomedical machine translation could enrich or um, supplement this lack of control vocabularies. Uh, I mentioned already, you know, the raw data and, and the importance of raw data for generating language models. To have a subset of them manually labeled by uh, clinical and uh, experts and also uh, linguistic uh, experts to build these semantic annotation applications uh, re dealing with named entity recognition, clinical concept recognition. And um, the, the key step here, and I think there's, it's, it's highly under-researched uh, so far, is this um, entity normalization and mapping to control vocabularies to really make it useful in, in practical terms. Um, looking at little the, the issues on the uh, annotation pipeline, the very first thing uh, is actually to define the problem and how you select the content, the documents you will uh, work on. And this is not very, it's not really trivial in the clinical uh, scenario. So how do you select the clinical records you want to work with? There's some, what you call, can call metadata, which is basically uh, clinical codes associated, but the, the, the content selection, I told you already, it's, it's very heterogeneous, the different types of records, it's highly uh, redundant. So data selection is, is, is still something also very, let's say, um, not very transparent, not very well researched, how you select the content, and also how you select the content to build high quality annotated data. Uh, so the, you, you need to search for the knowledge gap. If you want to apply that in practice later on for predictive modeling, if you don't select the appropriate uh, document, obviously you will not be able to capture the information you want to extract. And they usually need to be aligned also with the use cases. And the clinical use cases are very complex sometimes. So to select appropriate data is really difficult because you lack this metadata or rich metadata. Uh, and also the discussion with the uh, potential end users. So uh, if you're extracting this information and selecting the data, if you're not sure it will fit the user needs, the clin clinical needs, in the end this might be an, a huge issue in terms of um, what is really successful there. Um, and also one thing is what which we're working on is to use as a public data in, in the form of clinical case reports which are very specific type of publications in the medical field as a substitute data they're describing a patient and they're very similar to discharge summaries in some of the uh, cases as well um, and sometimes you just need to have some manual selection of the content if you really want to make sure that they're actually capturing what you are looking for uh, which is very time consuming. So if you look at the entire pipeline, just the data selection usually ma can uh, make up 20% of the effort in actually building these annotated resources and also the, the components behind them. Uh, um, another issue, and there's now an initiative uh, promoted by a research group in the UK, in the University of Manchester, and also some other European institutions is to uh, release and to propose 
a more robust, let's say, annotation scheme and guideline. So annotating clinical content is very complex and it's, it takes a lot of time and it's very expensive. But these guidelines, how you annotate the data, are usually not really released or they're very you know, basic and shallow. And I would say this, would, this really results in a sort of, uh, you have like a black box for AI, but this is the black box of annotated data. If you do not know what are the criteria, if they're not very well defined and how you actually label the data, uh, later on you're not able to interpret what this label will mean in the very first place, and you're not able to update the data sets. I told you already the, the content changes quite quickly. And you're not able to, uh, to apply it to other kind of uh, application scenarios. If you're annotating diseases and you're focusing on, on cancer and you want to adapt it to, for instance, cardiology, if the guidelines are not very clear and you cannot adapt them to other application scenarios, then you have to start from scratch again. So you need to have these guidelines, release them. They need to have the clinicians in, 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 in the loop. And there are some data sets and you look at the annotation process and they were annotated by IT experts or by linguists, and obviously clinical record needs to be um, labeled or you need to have the clini clini clinician in the loop, the medical language and content is very complex. And you need to refine these guidelines constantly. So the data changes and, and, and some of the things which are captured in the guideline uh, might lack or might miss information you, you have in, in, in real clinical records. So you need to refine and keep these things updated and, ver and keep versioning of these. Another thing is also to measure quality of these guidelines or the notation process. Uh, so what we do in the NLP field is usually having something called like a consistency analysis or internotate agreement. You have several people labeling the data. You are uh, in parallel and then later on you compare the labels and check out whether they're really labeling things in the same way and measure consistencies. Uh, and this is more like the upper boundary, which you would expect for uh, an automatic system to achieve, is two people do not agree. Obviously, this is a scenario where also the system would get confused in terms of the data label process. Uh, and then and another aspect, and I really would um, like to push towards that, is many of these annotated resources only focus on marking up the text or marking up and having some relations, but this doesn't really... Um, it's not very useful for clinical applications. You need to map and normalize or harmonize the output to control vocabularies. And this is something highly under-researched. Uh, uh, researched. And they also, um, there's, also, there's also a need to have um, software tools being more, uh, so, uh, more sophisticated and more um, efficient in manually assisting this mapping process because it can take up to two hours just to map one single concept in some of the scenarios because it tools are not there to have efficient mapping. We are this year organizing a track at the BioCreative um, effort, specifically focusing on more technical aspects, meaning um, we will uh, technically assess interfaces and applications which should assist in the, in the mapping to control vocabularies. Um, and obviously, you know, here it might, there might be some, some bias or some characteristics you need to take into account. What is the the control vocabulary to which you will map. Uh, going back to the guidelines, so we released a lot of these guidelines uh, in, in Spanish. They're all uh, ac accessible in f uh, for free in persistent repositories in Zenodo. Uh, and but, but obviously the data is in Spanish and the guidelines are in Spanish. So we are now uh, in, in the process of translating these guidelines first to English and then we also want to translate them to at least some of them to other languages, so Italian will be one of them, and we will also translate them to Dutch and to um, to uh, Swedish. Uh, you need to have these, uh, these protocols and notation guidelines available in your native language, and this is something which has been realized in the past and um, uh, clinical uh, computational clinics uh, in, the, in the last NLP in computational uh, linguistics conferences, there's a need, you cannot have instructions in English to label a, a clinical record in, in Italian. It doesn't really fit the different the characteristics of the content, it's very different. And this might result even in bias if you use these guidelines in English. Um, the manual annotation process is very tedious. I told you about you need several experts. You usually you need all, uh, clinicians also uh, uh, experts in, in computational linguistics to do that. Uh, some of the aspects here is also if you have to label from scratch, and we did it for some projects, this is really very time consuming and expensive. It can uh, take up uh, up to two years if you 
do this labeling process from scratch. So what is being done is usually you have some pre-annotation. And here's a word of caution. If you use terminologies for pre-annotation, this obviously will result in a, in a big bias. So here, one of the um, ways to go is actually to have some machine learning, also complement machine learning uh, appro approaches with pre-trained models, which help in pre-marking uh, the content. Uh, otherwise, this might not be very feasible for, for some of these projects. And again, the, the integration, normalization, harmonization is key to actually make these things a, a more, more robust. So what are we going? What, what are we doing in, in, in our group? So we're collaborating in, in, in the context uh, of, of COVID with uh, one of the major hospitals in Spain, the Hospital Clinique, and uh, their need in the very beginning was to automatically extract some clinical variables on the COVID patient records, and we were working them from the very beginning, the, from the first uh, wave until. I think it was the uh, sixth wave to actually extract some of this content, which obviously changed over time. Uh, we already had some base model trained on, on clinical case reports. So our process was really to adapt these models to the clinical uh, content that in-house in the hospital for different types of records, having uh, the clinician in a loop. So we had like a team of eight clinicians and we divided them according to different uh, concept types. So one team was work, working on symptoms, the other team was working on, cli on clinical procedures, another on medication, another one on, on species. And they're in, in an iterative uh, manner and uh, correcting and, and labeling the content, uh, generated a corpus to retrain and refine the uh, automatic extraction of the clinical var variables they were interested in. So it's like our recipe, and I think it, it, it worked quite well to deal with, is you have some public data set or synthetic data set, annotation schema and guidelines to generate a manually labeled data and train uh, initially like a component on this, uh, on this data set. Uh, usually they are transformer-based architectures to semantically annotate the uh, clinical content. And then in the clinical side with the data on the privacy, you know, inside the clinical setting, you pre-annotate the data, and with the clinic, uh, clinicians in the loop, you do the corrections to adapt it to the in-house clinical data set. And, and I think it's also an important, let's say, um, um, scenario in terms of giving them something back so that the system is adapted to their, their data and they can use it in-house. They don't need to deal with all the legal issue and sharing the data. And, uh, you, you, we all know what, how difficult it is to actually deal with the ethical committee, all the paperwork you have to do. So I think one needs to uh, think about alternative strategies because they're, they're not, you know, the other one doesn't really work very well. And here, you know, having the clinician and the clinical expert in the loop and refining and correcting the, the, these systems is key. You know, otherwise you can have a very nice system, it works with your data, you go to the clinical setting and it doesn't work at all. And then you're basically stuck in, a, in, a, in you know, how you actually make this thing, thing work. Uh, so how does this usually work? As, here's an example, you have content, in this case it's um, on symptom extraction. You pre-annotate with your transformer-based um, model the clinical uh, content. The clinician sees these suggested uh, labels, he corrects them, and then with the corrected version, in, a, in, in an iterative manner, following all, obviously these annotation guidelines. So there's also some, let's say, um, teaching process. You know, you have to tell them how to do the, the corrections, and they have to follow consistent criteria. Uh, for also, you know. So you need to do some training to the clinicians, which is not trivial at all, because they're very busy, they you know, have to see patients, they have to learn these guidelines. Often they don't understand what does it mean to label text. That's not what they're uh, usually doing, and they don't know exactly how these this, this, this things work. Um, so they correct this and can retrain this model. So here, I think one very important thing also to do and by the communities to have more scenarios and, and teaching and, and doing dissemination and, and training of clinical experts to be able to do this. So we were working with um, people uh, with documentalists, but we really need uh, for some of these uh, use cases, the clinician and even the specialist doing, doing these efforts. Um, so what we did and what we are generated through this uh, scenario is actually giving an unstructured clinical record, being able to automatically label this content with systems 
I told you about this iterative uh, correction. Now we have uh, over 40 different entity types already um, and, and components uh, adapted for Spanish, which ranges with, from recognition of symptoms, diseases, clinical procedures, medications, uh, chemical compounds and, and uh, drugs, clinical observations, um, we have professions, we also have locations of various types. Uh, and also clinical uh, con contextual modifiers, meaning temporal expressions like duration, when something started, when, uh, and, and also negation speculation, which is really key if you build a knowledge graph from textual data. If, if the, say, uh, he doesn't have this syndrome or he didn't have this disease, this is really very important and it's one of these confounding factors when you consume these resources. So the clinical negation or the negation extraction uh, pipeline is also key to actually make these things uh, practically useful. And mapping these automatically extracted concepts to terminologies, we use a lot SOMED CT, but for other scenarios we also used ESCO for professions and occupations and um, or, or NCBI taxonomy for species and, and or ICD-10 for, for procedures. So in, in the very end with this you know strategy you are able to also generate structured data directly from the unstructured content. Um, so I'm a little behind uh, time, um, so I'm, I might rush a little more here and, and skip some of these slides. So one of the thing, we are things which is, is also key by the community and by the developers of clinical NLP is to know the quality. You need to know how good the results are. And especially with uh, lots of commercial solutions, but this is a little, little like hidden beneath the desk. You, if you ask how you train the model, how do you generate the, the tool, Usually it's very difficult to get some clear answer, but if, if you had asked how good the results are, how you evaluated uh, each of these different components, there's usually a very ambiguous answer. You never know, what, you know what's the quality. So here in, in, in the modern academic community, shared tasks are the way to go and um, are the way to actually uh, generate data sets which have high impact. You share them with the community. They all are trained and built on the on, on these data sets and you can transparently actually compare the results and you avoid that uh, this scenario at one data set, one tool and yeah, to I told you already how difficult it is to generate this data set. It can be, I mentioned here in the slide, three to six uh, to seven months. This is a very optimistic view. Usually it can take more than one year to generate a data set. You share it with the community and to compete on, on solving this particular task around the data set and you can compare the results in a more efficient way. There have been lots of different shared tasks, and this is a very outdated slide but from 2015, but there, there are lots of shared tasks on, on, on clinical uh, NLP, which range from search engine, semantic annotation, text classification, semantic annotation, uh, relation extraction, automatic summarization, question answering by medical machine translation. So these were really the, the key instruments to boost the performance in, in our community. and. Uh, I also th would say uh, it's also a way to engage uh, and students in, in generating uh, or learning how to implement these systems in a more in a more robust way. Um, as I'm a little lacking behind time, I will very quickly highlight some of these. We have been working on shared tasks for oncology, finding mentions of uh, tumor morphology in clinical coding to ICD ICD09, uh, ICD03. Uh, clinical coding, so assigning clinical codes, ICD-10 codes uh, to, to textual data, semantic indexing, which is basically indexing with mesh terms, in this case content in Spanish, text anonymization and de-identification. So here we also have one on, on, uh, on, on, on drug, chemical compound recognition. So all of these mentions were manually labeled with uh, annotation guidelines, and uh, consistency evo uh, evaluation, and then mapped to in this case, to SNOMED CT IDs. Uh, we had one on, I told you already, on, on, on oncology. And basically, the task also has, had to do with finding all these mentions and they were very strict in evaluation. So even if you have like only one character um, um, wrong, the answer was, was uh, basically a false, a false positive. So, so we were really, you know, very, uh, let's say, um, conservative in evolution scenarios. So you had to find the mentions, you had to map them to, ICDO uh, uh, identifiers, and then we also had one which was basically sort of clinical coding scenario. Uh, teams are very good. So if you look at uh, um, um, the F scores, um, 
of this team. So and this is already a couple of years uh, back. So now the systems even uh, are achieving better results. So they are quite quite good. If you compare them to, to humans, which basically have a, a similar range of, of consistencies, we had one on anonymization, so finding all uh, potential sensitive information in the text and uh, masking them. We also asked them in another subtract to identify what kind of uh, sensitive uh, entity it was. Uh, with over 27 categories in the US, the only I told you you need to uh, the to mask 18 classes, so we were quite exhaustive in this in this uh, setting. And we used this shared task also to implement a system adapted to this uh, COVID corpus I told you previously, um, generated at the hospital clinic. And this corpus will be released in a couple of weeks in FusionNet, where also Mimic, uh, Mimic 4 is, is, is being published. So we are collaborating with people from Mimic. So it will be the first uh, clinical um, corpus published in, in FusioNet and also with the annotation guidelines on how to de-identify and semantic annotations of these data sets. Um, we had some other tracks on occupations and professions and as, um, social status. So I think uh, we all know that um, occupations are very important also in terms of our health. So there are exposures to, uh, let's say, zoonosis or stress, uh, depression and uh, even the, so, the social status, if someone is like um, uh, homeless, this also is important to capture when doing the, the, the clinical, uh, let's say, um, characteristics of the patient. So we were working uh, also one on biomedical machine translation, on the recognition of diseases, and uh, also the recognition of species and, and pathogens, including also family members and, and food. Um, so I'm not going into details, all of them are manually labeled, uh, we had, had the mentions labeled, they're all normalized, we all released these, these um, guidelines and um, all the resources we are generating, we make them public, they're in repositories, we also have like videos of how the systems work of the participants and the evolution libraries and, and um, all the other kind of resources. Uh, for diseases, we also had, like I told you already, um, a, a competition, and we also generated a multilingual uh, content, uh, or a version of our of our gold standard data set. So it, uh, for that, we used uh, m m machine translation systems. Uh, I told you already, we were working on benchmarking a medical machine translation in in, in, a, in another scenario. So we, we did machine translation of the of the case reports, and we had a let's say. Um, an annotation transfer strategy to actually map the mentions of these diseases to the other languages. So this data set is published in English and uh, all the Romance languages. I think we only have Corsican missing, but all the others are there. Uh, and how does it look? So basically we have a sort of parallel data set, the, the original data set in Spanish with the mentions labeled and the translated uh, data set also with the mentions uh, labeled and normalized in this case for, for English. Uh, we had also participants in these different tracks from, from different countries. So actually this track on disease mention was won by a team in Italy, which was, which was very interested in adapting this technology to content in Italian. Other tracks have mentioned that also participants from, from Germany, which won one year, from China another year. So I think it's there's a global interest actually also you know, beyond people working on, 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 on in Spanish. The technology behind these uh, teams, obviously they use transformer-based architectures. They usually have, um, uh, they use uh, pre-trained language models which, which were adapted to uh, clinical content in, in this case uh, in Spanish. And they also have more sophisticated techniques to do this entity linking or mapping, um, exploiting text similarity approaches. Um, if you look at the results, I think one really needs to differentiate when you talk about NLP, clinical NLP results. You need to look at what are, your, what are the results in terms of what, of ki what, what kind of entity, what kind of clinical concept it is. Obviously for de-identification and anonymization, these results need to be very high. You need to be very uh, robust in, in, in not having any leakage of sensitive information. So the Medicon track in the very end was dealing with the anonymization part. So there it's key to have uh, these high, high precision results uh, and, and they're also easier. Uh, other um, tracks like finding species mentions was also you know, quite easy for some of these systems. But diseases obviously is a much more complex uh, scenario and even for clinicians sometimes it's not so easy to label diseases. 
We had one on species recognition, and I'm not going into many details. Obviously, finding species is, and pathogens, a virus is key. We had like the pandemia, and uh, you know we know this, you know, might come up uh, again. Uh, finding this uh, species is also important for like food allergies or allergies in general, antibiotic resistance, and 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 you know just just like. Uh, Food contamin contamination, so on. So we also we also had this drug, where we had to find all these mentions and normalize them in this case to NCBI taxonomy. And again, we also released a multilingual version. In this case, it's even easier to adapt it because in the case of uh, scientific nomenclature types of species mentions, they, are, they might be the same. Although we, we saw that depending on how they mention it, there might be even variances in, on, on the scientific names there as well. Uh, and, and again, we, we had this approach in translating and generating these resources beyond what was the original uh, data set in, in Spanish. Teams had very good uh, performances and, and uh, I think you can already use these things for downstream applications in the clinical setting. We have two ongoing tracks which are finishing now. One is on locations. So we all, or many of you, traveled here. So. Uh, there's an interest also in um, travel health or more health related to, to movements of patients. And our original motivation was actually several years ago with uh, COVID when the clinicians told us we need to know where the patient uh, came from, where he traveled, and what is the movement of the patient uh, also inside the hospital setting, from which facilities he came, and so on. So, our motivation behind that it was several years ago, but it took us some time to actually generate the data set. So we have one track now uh, which is finishing on location, another one on clinical procedures. So obviously, um, you know, it's important to capture the movement of patients, especially for some of these more infectious diseases, but also like for other kinds of uh, scenarios where you need to know the origin of the patient in terms of the prevalence of some diseases which are endemic or tropic diseases. But also, uh, like um, we, we identify language of the patient. If you want to know what is the language the patient is speaking, and you want to have you know some, a, a translator uh, there, sometimes it's very convenient to know this kind, kind of uh, inform information as well. Especially for nosocomial diseases, where the patient moved inside the hospital setting is is key as well. Also, um, you know, we generate a data set in, in English for this for this uh, scenario. Um, and I'm terrible behind time, so I just want to say that uh, these t t t tasks have high impact. You're generating lots of systems through these competitions. Um, usually it's a global effort and also commercial teams are participating there. Uh, you're generating resources which can be reused later on. And the focus, in, in, at least in our case, was to adapt them directly to clinical use cases uh, which we're working with, with in, in the context of hospitals. And I encourage those which have students to actually promote uh, participating. We have did surveys in all of these tracks and uh, basically most of the, the times people said it was also an educational experience for people, for students, uh, which learned in a more competitive way how to implement these, these tools. And uh, to finish, I will maybe only um, mention that we were working on um, some EU projects, um, like uh, uh, on, on adapting these resources for cardiology uh, in uh, different clinical sites, one in Italy, the Hospital Gemelli, one in, in Spain, one in the UK, in, 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 in Sweden and Czechia and Romania. Um, so in, in case of the cardiology application, I told you these different hospitals, we are applying this machine translation notation transfer to extract clinical variables in a comparative, comparative way across different clinical sites with this adaptation human in the loop uh, strategy. We are also having one on heart failure uh, very uh, less hospitals, but we are also crossing the crossing Europe. We have one partner in, in Tanzania and one in Peru. So we also will looking at different low resource setting in terms of processing clinical content there. And like in biomaterials, we we also looking at things more related to devices, medical devices, and biomaterials. In this case, only in a bilingual setting. Um, and um, I think uh, as a Take home message is we, we need to engage the community in testing and generating um, these systems in a more collaborative way, going beyond English. And 
associating the results to uh, quality measurements and actually um, get the clinicians in, in the loop to provide the input we need there. And that's basically it. I wanted to acknowledge the funding uh, agencies and also our clinical collaborators. Thanks a lot for your, for your, for listening. Thank you very much. Um, I'll let you now for the answers and the questions. Um, any questions? Thank you, Martin, for the presentation. I only have one question. And that is, uh, what do you think uh, about the large computational cost required to train these uh, L L models, like ChatGPT? Do you think that we have a computer resource uh, capable of doing these models uh, in our country and with our resource? Thank you. So, I, th I think it's obviously a bottleneck. Uh, at BC, uh, there's another uh, group working spe specifically in, in large language models. There's a huge computational cost, obviously, this is one issue, but I, th I think updating the data or getting the, the, the data sources is even more difficult than storing that. So, um, I think there are facilities in Europe which can offer the infrastructure you need. Um, like the one in Finland, I told you, the one in Italy and in Spain, and they're also supercomputing maybe smaller uh, infrastructures ac across Europe and also in other countries. In Brazil, there's also, you know, there, there's also infrastructure. What we need actually is uh, maybe project financing this because it's very um, cost intensive at, uh, you know, running and generating these models. But so it's not just that you have the infrastructure to do it, you need to have the money to actually do the calculations. And I think here uh, what is missing are projects, public projects, which actually finance the computational capacities which uh, are required to run these models. So I think it's not just like the capacity itself, but also money to, to, to run this and generate the model itself. And there's not much you know, going on on that side. Uh, thank you. You used in your talk a number of times the term um, structure. And I understand that language has a structure. But language with a structure is used to convey, in the medical setting, medical knowledge with a structure. When you use the term structure, are you talking about structure in the language or structure in the medical knowledge? So structure in this case means structured data representation, which is like a data model, uh, meaning that if... Um, like we have structured data, which is ICD-10 codes. This is like a structured um, tabular data, or you have um, basically data model behind that. So when I say structured data, I mean a data model, structured data model, not like structured data. Obviously, language has structure, although clinical languages might be less structured sometimes. So, so, so there's, no, there's no medical knowledge structure? No, it's, it's basically a data model or data model representation. Thanks for the interesting talk. Um, you gave lots of examples of different tasks and applications and, and techniques. I'm wondering, do you have examples of applications that have already been widely deployed in, in clinical setting, you know, across countries, for example, and on the other hand, maybe applications that could have a, a huge impact but are still a bit far away from clinical maturity in terms of a deployment to a clinical setting? So uh, this is a very t tricky question because there's the barrier in, in integrating these tools in the hospital setting and there are quite a lot of regulations and I have to say the uh, data management or, or infrastructure in, at hospitals, sometimes the, um, um, data management infrastructure is not very good and not very interoperable. 
So usually the settings are more for research projects. Uh, obviously clinical coding software is one of these scenarios that is being used in many of these hospitals. Uh, and some of these tools do re rely at least on, in terms of um, benchmarking or adapting the model to on, 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 on shared tasks. But obviously these are commercial solutions, so it's difficult to know how they do that. But my, my here, the issue is really that uh, the, I would say the hospital infrastructure is not very well prepared for taking up, and that many of the hospitals, even the big ones, they lack experts in, in data mining, or they don't have a data mining unit which is able to connect it to the like to the other kind of software infrastructure they do have. So it's maybe not not a positive comment, but. Um, <laughs> Um, within the European context, is there such a term as a medical informatician? That is, a medically trained person who's gone off into one of the, one of the informatics areas and become, ex, you know, moderately expert in that, so that they can actually sit and translate things for and, and work within these projects. Does that particular So I, I might not be the appropriate person. I, my, my understanding is that it's very heterogeneous. So in each country, there might be a different scenario. Um, in Spain, as, as, as far as I know, there are like biomedical engineering degrees. I'm not sure that there or might be some specialization in medical informatics, but I don't think it's like a standardized, let's say, job description. Uh, it might vary a lot. And uh, my, my feeling is it's very much um, bias towards particular kinds of information like imaging. So there's hardly anything in terms of the programs and how the you know the skills are dealing with uns with the textual data. I mean, uh, the, the data the clinician is generating is primarily textual data. Yeah. Even the imaging is done usually by technicians. So for, for me, it's very surprising that you know working on the topic that that's what the clinician is actually entering in the in the uh, um, uh, system. But it's not really being explored almost at all, and uh, yeah, it's, more, it's more like imaging, I would say. Which in, in our circumstance, there is no, there is nobody with a medical degree within the IT structure, including data governance, including chief information officer. Nobody has a medical degree. In and I know, I know for, for certain in um, Sri Lanka, they actually have a track. So you uh, qualify as a doctor, you do your internship, you do one more year, and then you decide, I'm going to be a cardiologist, a respiratory physician, a surgeon, an oncologist, or a medical informatician. And there's a, and there's a defined path to have medical informatics within the, within the uh, medical setting. And perhaps that's something that should be uh, um, pushed out as an idea within the countries to see whether that starts to gain some, uh, some traction. If I may in this, actually we are in Italy at least we are doing this in some universities we have degrees in uh, medicine which are hybrid so you have also a you get also a degree in biomedical engineering so you have background on data analytics and informatics and so on. So that's we are moving in that direction I think that's a good idea. Thank you. Any other question? Congratulations for your interesting talk. I have a lot of <laughs> questions, but I just just one. Uh, you have a sort of interrater uh, annot an an annotation agreement, and uh, I imagine that uh, you have a sort of uh, uh, ambiguity in in the choice. How do you manage this uh, uncertainty related to the interpretation of these sentences? So there, there are different sources of variability. Obviously, the background knowledge is one of them. Um, so what we usually have in these guidelines, we have them. I didn't go into details because people usually don't like guidelines. But we have them very well structured, like general rules, positive rules. So what you should mark up, negative rules, what you should not mark up, more linguistic characteristics because obviously there's some things more like if they say um, 
A and B, should I mark A and should I mark B or A and B, but this depends. So these kind of things, the discrepancies are usually solved through discussion. You look at what is the, um, this, the course, Does, didn't he follow a rule which was there? Or was there some under specification, so something missing which you didn't really observe previously? And in the second scenario, you can add additional examples or rules. Um, sometimes uh, things are just too difficult to solve and you need to have convention. So by convention, this will be like the, like very, let's say, very predefined or fixed to avoid this, um, to, to have too much variability in, in the results. And you have to measure them. So that some of these experiences are very, like, let's say, difficult to reach the agreement and we had even to remove persons from some, some of these projects because they just didn't follow what, you know, what are the rules. So usually it's like checking out the course. Was, is it missing in the rule? And do we need more examples? Do we need more training? Or we just add a convention there? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, for a matter of time, I would love to cut the, the questions. But if you have any other questions, please. Uh, ask later if you are here. We'll, you will be still here till for the day. And uh, just as a greeting, this uh, little bit for you. Thank you for your presence here for an interesting and very precious talk. Thank you so much. It was really very nice. And uh, also, the audience was very nice. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. So we can uh, start with the parallel sessions now, so you can go to the prepared room. Okay, good morning everyone. We are uh, here to, uh, to this track and I would like to thank you all of you to be here w with us and submitting paper to, to, this, uh, to this track. Uh, together with me chair the session uh, Sofia Romagnoli from Università Politecnica delle Marche and uh, since we are a little bit uh, uh, in delay we start immediately with uh, Alfredo or Mazabal, I hope that I pronounce it well with uh, the study entitled Clinician's Perspective on Trusting Patient Generated Health Data for Using Clinical Decision Making, a qualitative interview study. The floor is yours. Hello. Um, my name is Alfredo Ramazzano. Uh, I'm a clinical scientist from the Center. Uh, I'm a PhD student in the Adapt Center in Trinity College, Dublin, uh, and my um, article explores the clinician's perspective on trusting a pre-GHD patient genetic health data for the use in clinical uh, decision making. Uh, just a quick definition, uh, PGHD uh, refers to health-related data that is created or recorded by patients or their caregivers. Um, it's uh, different from a cl clinical data because it's, it's the patient that controls this data. Um, it's often uh, referred to uh, data uh, often uh, recorded by electronic means like wearables or sometimes uh, take home medical devices like uh, insulin pumps. Uh, and some of them uh, involved some form of artificial intelligence uh, in the background. Um, the, we know what PGHD is, and it's, the, its value is quite recognized, but it's not entirely uh, recognized for the use on um, to make clinical decisions. So, for us to put ourselves in the perspective of the mission, we need to understand how they make clinical decisions, how they use their clinical judgment. Uh, and a, a good way of seeing it is compared to somebody driving a car. They uh, use a range of information from all different sources, often all at the same time. A bit like driving a car, where you're trying to judge whether you're going too fast or too slow. And maybe your um, speedometer, the analog speedometer, is near the 100, but you're not sure whether, whether it's, if you're looking at it like this, it's over 100, you're looking at it like this, it's under 100. Uh, but some cars might also have a digital, which has more precision. Uh, 
but uh, there's other ways for you to have a rough estimation of um, uh, your speed. Um, you can use your, your, your common sense, your heuristics. Um, you can look out the window and you can see that you're not doing 20 kilometers, you're doing 100 or around 100. Uh, clinicians also do, do these type of judgments. When they see a patient coming in the, 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 um, the room, they're already gauging what the patient's status is. Uh, the tricky part, and they know how to make these decisions, the tricky part is when they have to include the patient through chair decision making, um, and they want to include the patient in the decision. It's like having a guy sitting in the back seat telling you, actually, you're not doing 105, you're doing 97 kilometers an hour, and it's not a right turn ahead of you, it's a left turn. So they don't know exactly whether they should trust this data that the patient brings to them or not. This is why I wanted to understand the clinician's perspective on the quality and provenance of PGHD. Um, also, I wanted to see the role of guidance and governance and, uh, and regulation in shaping their trust in PGHD. Um, I also wanted to explore the context in which clinicians make these decisions using PGHD, uh, and hopefully I wanted to inform the development of a tool to help clinicians uh, with this decision, whether they want to include this information coming from the patient or not. Um, for this, I, um, this is a, a, an exploratory, uh, exploratory qualitative uh, study uh, on the clinician's perspective. I used online semi-structure interviews, um, and I recruited uh, clinicians who were in contact with patients and had to make decisions based on information uh, uh, using snowball sampling. That is, I uh, recruit somebody and I got that person to recommend one or two or as many as clinicians they could recommend in the area that would be interested in the data. Um, and I kept on recruiting until I just found that there was, the interviews just were not bringing any new information. Um, this happened last year, and uh, the interviews were uh, audio recorded, uh, transcribed, and analyzed using Audible 12. I used uh, thematic coding uh, in three stages. First, I uh, did uh, open coding, uh, I did axial coding, and then uh, at some point I started recognizing uh, different uh, themes to the interviews. So, in total, I ended up uh, interviewing 13 patients, uh, 13 clinicians, um, for about uh, 40 minutes each. Uh, all of the interviews, in all of the interviews, uh, clinicians were um, familiar with PGHC, which is not a surprise given that it's snowball sampling. Um, and 10 out of 13 clinicians said that they had seen patients bringing their PGHD to their uh, consultation room. Uh, only one clinician was completely against it, uh, which was interesting because the reasons that they quoted for not using PGHD were the same as the other uh, clinicians had their concerns. Uh, and most of them said that they use PGHD. Uh, they would accept it as part of the uh, patient's symptoms account. Uh, in total, I identified five themes. One of them was uh, guidance, governance, and regulation. Um, mostly, it was about clinicians saying that they, there is no guidance, uh, definitely not in Ireland, uh, and that they have to make decisions on, on PGHD often. In terms of quality, it wasn't um, a surprise. Um, uh, accuracy was a major, major concern. Um, evidence behind the PGHD technology was also required for trusting. Uh, but this particularly was about evidence that they can understand uh, in the language that clinicians are used to deal with. Uh, and also um, the adequacy of uh, the information to be used in the setting. That is, 
often was mentioned the, the um, Apple Watch that detects atrial fibrillation. And often they say, well, that's fine, but this, I don't know what to do with uh, a 20 year old saying that, they, that their Apple Watch uh, detected atrial fibrillation. I, I just don't know what to do. I, I, know, I, I don't know how to act on that because I can't give them blood thinners, for instance. Um, in terms of provenance and the origin of, of data, um, prescribed PGHD seems to be more likely to be trusted. That is, prescribed, prescribed PGHD is PGHD that was initiated by the clinician. The, the clinician said, hey, go ahead and uh, check your steps or something like that using this, your watch. Uh, mostly they were inter interested in the patients, or knowing the patient's capabilities and intentions, and, and also the organization behind the technology to capture PGH. Uh, in terms of contextual factors, um, their clinician's familiarity with the, with the technology, that is, if they use the technology on a regular basis, they're more likely to trust it. Um, uh, and they were also concerned about the subjectivity of patients and their lack of familiarity on behalf of the patients with the technology. Um, very important uh, contextual factor was the risk and the severity of the consequences of, the consequences, uh, of using incorrect data. Very often was cited, what if it's a child? If it's a child, I'm not using it. Things like that. Uh, and as a surprise, it came uh, that um, the need for PGHD is an important factor in terms of trusting PGHD because you have no choice. When it comes to, like, for instance, COVID, um, patients have no access to, uh, to the patient in person uh, and they couldn't have them in the hospital for long, so they use uh, PGHD as an alternative and they used it successfully. So, what can we say about those results? Um, there are limitations to um, qualitative research. Uh, the claims that we make are not that decisive, but if we pair them with what we know about literature and what we know about um, previous experiences of adoption of technology, we can say that these are the uh, main themes to, to pay attention to when it comes to trying to get uh, patients to, to trust PGHD. And going back to the conclusions, um, basically there are five themes that were recognized in my research. Um, there's a, 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 group, a desperate lack of guidance for PGHD uh, when it comes to making decisions. And uh, there were strong Maybe not as many mentions, but immediate mentions of accuracy, evidence, and the risk of patient. Um, I believe this uh, has a modest uh, advancement on our understanding of PGHD uh, use. Uh, I think, I'm hoping that it will uh, inform safe and effective use of PGHD in the clinical setting. And um, I am currently developing. Uh, a tool that helps patients uh, reflect on the quality and all of these aspects of PGHD. Um, thank you very much uh, for your attention, and I'm hoping I can answer all your questions. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes, please. Practitioners for skin, there was um, diabetics uh, clinic uh, staff, uh, clinicians, uh, there was GPs. Um, yes, there's a, a large difference between the different dif disciplines. Um, in diabetes, for instance, they're very much comfortable with it. Um, when it comes to GPs, 
they have more room to maneuver, uh, and some of them use PGHD, some of them don't. There was um, uh, physiotherapists that used p uh, pedometers a lot, uh, and they didn't. Surprisingly, they didn't care about the the accuracy. They were like, I just want to know that they're walking. Uh, so th there's many va uh, valences to this data that can be used uh, on their behalf. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to get them to reflect on this in a, in a structured uh, manner. Because trust is very tricky and very slippery. You might trust somebody with something one day, and the next day you won't trust them for the exact same thing because the context changed and you, or, or there's a better option and you can trust somebody better. Or you learn something else about that person. Does that answer a bit? Okay, thank you very much again. Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Andrea Tigrini with uh, his work on uh, gate event uh, time series assessment uh, through spectral biomarkers and machine learning. Actually, no. there are 
they are more simple than uh, neural networks and deep neural networks model. So, in general, the aim of the uh, engineering perspective is to design the sensoristic part and uh, the information extraction part, uh, delivering data, uh, data analysis and data-driven model for uh, the early recognition of the pathology. So, between the two, uh, the two perspectives, uh, we can recognize the motor biomarkers that clinicians define are, in some sense, uh, sorry, play a key role like in uh, the features, uh, the handcraft features we extracted in the engineering perspective. Uh, so the aim of this study is to investigate recent biomarkers that we have introduced in, a, in our uh, recent work, um, on, uh, get, extracted from gate time series in Parkinson's disease, Huntington disease, and other uh, ALS uh, patients. Uh, and we compare, we create machine learning model to compare the, um, to discriminate between pathological and healthy group. Because we want to use this model to allow a retrospective analysis from clinicians uh, to the gate data. So we employed a um, public available data set that was created by Arthur in 2000 but is still really used in, uh, in this field, in which we have six, 16 healthy patients, 15 Parkinson's disease, 20 Huntington's disease, and 13 ALS. Uh, all the data uh, are prolonged data since the, the, these patients work for uh, five minutes uh, along a walkway of 77 meters. So we have a lot of gate cycles uh, upon which we can characterize uh, uh, certain timing events. Just to uh, make you a little bit uh, more uh, um, able to understand this, uh, this is a typical gate cycle, okay, in which we have many events. And the interval between, for instance, the initial contact of the foot uh, of one leg and the initial contact of the foot of the same leg after one gate cycle is called striding interval. We can define other events of interest, and if we have many gate cycles, this timing becomes a time series. And we extract from uh, this patient uh, uh, four important time series. Uh, and I want, I, uh, I want to understand, um, I want to stress that stride interval is uh, nowadays the most used time series, rather than the other. So, we realized this time series, uh, and since um, from the noise of the sensor we get some um, what is called uh, outliers, we impute this data by substituting the, these uh, points with the median value of the time series in order to uh, not change so much the characteristics, the, the statistical characteristics of this time series. We employ a, a simple threshold detector that we, uh, our group, we model, modeled in a recent study, and we start to extract um, our uh, six uh, motor biomarkers, or six features that we propose as the motor biomarkers. Um, here we based uh, um, essentially on two main uh, mathematical tools to extract this. Uh, that is the Percival theorem that permits to compute the power of the entire uh, time series, spectral power of the entire time series in time. So it is if it allows com computational efficiency within our feature extraction um, part. And we actually use the, uh, the property of the Fourier transform of the derivative of the sigma. And we define essentially the, uh, the features based on the first three even model of uh, even um, moment of the spectral distribution. <coughs> so uh, we define these th uh, three features and uh, other uh, additive three features uh, that are more uh, complex, the sparseness, the irregularity factor, and the uh, waveform length ratio. Um, since all of uh, these features uh, generally are uh, produces right skew uh, distributions, we apply logarithm to just to linearize the, the features and uh, render, making the, the feature space a little bit more uh, easy to handle with the typical machine learning model. 
So what we do um, was the application of uh, the one subject out uh, cross-validation approach to realize uh, um, four binary classifiers for LDA, QD, so LDA, QDA, KNM, and extreme learning machine uh, to compare the healthy group against the uh, pathological disease group. Okay, for the Parkinson disease, what we observe is that uh, um, the DS time series uh, provided really good results. And, uh, however, the role of DS uh, is already confirmed in the, in the literature. Um, since, uh, actually, in Parkinson disease, we have seen that there is uh, difficulties in, uh, in exchange the, the weight from one length to the other during the, the walk. From Huntington disease, um, the, it is interesting to see that uh, the strike time interval is confirmed as a good source of uh, information since the biomarkers works well for each of the model developed. We reach uh, error rates um, lower than uh, uh, or across 0 .0 0 0.1. Uh, but what was uh, uh, interesting is that we see that also the SA time series is, uh, could be a source of information to extract good biomarkers for characterizing the, uh, this pathology. So within SA time series, uh, we should suggest clinicians to investigate the reason why this uh, aspect in the gate uh, cycles is important. For the ALS uh, patient, the, so the, the discrimination between ALS and uh, um, uh, healthy group is also interesting because it uh, was less treated in the literature as a problem. We get really good results when we approach with KNN, uh, reducing the error rate um, also uh, at a level lower than uh, 0.1, and we see there that the S8 and series is of uh, great importance for the discrimination because the biomarkers that we extracted from this time series um, had a good uh, um, capability to extract reliable features. So, in conclusion, uh, what we have said is that this model that we developed uh, um, can be used in more complex uh, decision architecture to discriminate between uh, health and pathological groups. Moreover, we have another um, confirmed that the features that we are proposing as, as motor biomarkers can be effectively used as motor biomarkers since they produce uh, good results in these, uh, all of these uh, discrimination um, problems. And, uh, more important for us uh, and perhaps for clinician is that the double support uh, um, the double support phase of the gate cycle could be really important to characterize uh, such neuro, mm, neurodegenerative disease uh, and to focus so on this event uh, of the gate uh, time series. So I thank you for your attention and if there are questions uh, are of course welcome. Okay, thank you for the presentation. Are there any questions? Okay. Okay, thank you for the interesting talk. I have actually two questions. Uh, the first one is, you think that the results for Parkinson with double support is connected to the fact that some of the subjects exhibit increasing of age while from the test? Because usually it's, you see when they are like turning or they're setting the top bits and they are actually to move again. Yeah, it, it is surely due to, to, to this and that the, uh, during also freezing, uh, the, um, there is this sort of difficulties in uh, exchange uh, the weight from one leg to the other. But I, however, the, the whole way was long, so the patients um, know this, frequent, this uh, freezing event. But uh, this is interesting because it could be something that is uh, developed during uh, and is difficult to discover during uh, uh, work. Instead, with the features that we propose, we saw these differences also from a distribution point of view that we do not report it, but 
there is the capability to discriminate this. Okay. Thank you very much. And the second question is, uh, you tried binary classification, so you classify pathology versus health, right? Yes. You think that, uh, or you try to uh, actually a multi-class problem with what the disease is like to see whether it's like a so-called signature of each disease that may be allowed to discriminate between the different Yes, we also had some results, reported some results in our main paper recently published. I, if you are interested, I show immediately this one. Uh, our recent paper on this approach, we also developed some um, binary classifiers, architecture for discriminating uh, between pathologies and all, uh, sorry, between the LT group and the all the pathological cases. Uh, here the focus were more on uh, the development of um, a decision-making tool rather than uh, to propose retrospective analysis to clinicians. But however, if you are interested, this is a, a paper in which we did these classifications and we get uh, really good results. Even with a simple uh, machine learning model like uh, SVM with uh, ECOC uh, error correcting output scheme for the multi-class uh, uh, model. Any other question? Yes? Yes, uh, thank you for your talk for the BPT. Uh, my question was if about uh, the, long, the, the data range, uh, what is the length of the data you uh, yes. So is it since the beginning of someone you visit? Or the, the whole collection you have, is it at a certain point? Or do you have like, uh, so for many years, and if you have for many years, how much uh, dependencies can you collect and uh, make a connection? Okay, now to perhaps I didn't explain well this. During this, uh, during the, the, the walkway, the, um, sorry, during the gate, we have many gate cycles. Okay, so from each gate cycle, for instance, this is the strike time, from one event to the other strike event, and we have more than 250. Uh, gate cycles because as you can see here the time series goes more than 250. Do not look at time here because we this is a mistake, it's not in second. This is just a sample, okay? 100, 150, 250 uh, uh, and more. So we have this time series of uh, more than 250 for each subject and since we have more than 250 gate cycles and this is uh, consistent with the literature to have this sort of, uh, of, um, of data because having long walkway for a Parkinson's disease or for other kind of neurodegenerative disease is uh, really, really complex. But as you can see from the time series, uh, the time series has a sort of autoregressive behavior. So what we believe is that uh, perhaps we can use less data, so less gate cycle, and this is perhaps a investigation point that uh, should be um, should be at least assessed in future study. So the minimum amount of uh, data needed to extract reliable features is uh, uh, a good research point in the future. I hope that they answered. I know. Well. Any other question? No. Okay. So thank you. Okay, we can move to the next speaker, that is uh, Giulia Raffaiani. She will present a machine learning based method for cyber risk assessment. Especially if we think about uh, um, 
organization from that are critical infrastructure, for example, healthcare organization. Uh, in these cases, uh, assessing risks uh, is really is really crucial. What we have in literature, we have uh, a lot of different international standards uh, that provide some guidelines, uh, provide uh, best practices. But uh, there is not a method that is universally recognized as, as the optimal one for assessing cyber risk. Um, there are really a lot of different methods uh, in the literature. Those methods can be divided in, into two main classes. That are the uh, qualitative methods and quantitative ones. If we speak of qualitative methods, uh, they are based on non-numerical categories. So for example, they assess risk using uh, adjectives. So low risk, medium risk, or high risk. Uh, obviously, they are uh, time and cost efficient. So they are really cheap, really uh, easy to use. But uh, they are often subjective because different uh, assessors can uh, give different results and different uh, um, outputs. Quantitative methods instead are based on numbers, so they are uh, more objective. Their results are really uh, robust, they are reproducible, they are comparable, but uh, at the opposite, they are often difficult to perform and to understand also, and they are really, really expensive. Uh, quantitative methods are the best one if we talk about results, but they uh, are uh, often rely on uh, external uh, experts or on the so-called calibrated experts. So there is someone that needs to uh, learn how to perform the assessment. Or often they require, um, they require past data, so knowledge on past data that is not often easy to, to do. So what we are doing here is like we are trying to develop a, a tool that is an easy tool for assessing cyber risk. Uh, that has the advantages of uh, quantitative methods, so uh, comparable results, robust results, but we, without requiring so many expertise. We found out that artificial intelligence is a suitable means to do, to do, to do this. I will start talking about our quantitative method uh, for assessing cyber risk we were working on on the, on the last years that is called MAGIC, that is a method for assessing cyber risk in, in, uh, incidents. Um, because uh, we started from here to develop the, the machine learning model. This uh, uh, method uh, takes uh, some inputs and, give, and gives us output the uh, probability of occurrence of a cyber, uh, of a cyber incident. The inputs of, uh, of this method uh, is, first of all, the maturity of the organization. That is, uh, uh, can be defined as the level of adherence uh, to the controls uh, of uh, some cybersecurity framework. So what we were talking uh, before of the best practices that are given by the uh, international organizations. Then we have the complexity that instead can be defined by, uh, as the level of intricacy of the organization, so of the technological infrastructure of the organization. It's not only the number of employees, for example, but uh, also uh, how many servers there are, how many devices, and so on. And then the third one is the attractiveness of the organization. That is related to the level of interest that this organization causes in potential attackers. So obviously attackers will aim to uh, obtain the, the greatest profit. So they will attack some organization that have for example, sensitive data that they can then uh, sell online for, uh, for high profit. And then we have another input that is the expected number of attacks. So how many attacks an organization uh, expect to, uh, to be subjected to. This is a probabilistic method. So we use some probabilistic uh, uh, curves and we obtain as output uh, the likelihood of occurrence of these cyber events. Uh, what we are doing here is like testing this method with real data. So what happens if we uh, know some uh, companies, we know maturity, complexity, and attractiveness of those companies, what happens? So we started creating the, the data set, of course. Uh, there, is not, there are uh, really a lot of different data sets in the literature that uh, contain different cyber incidents uh, that occurred. 
Um, for our cases, we merged two different data sets that are one for uh, one um, contain the cybersecurity incidents uh, uh, from 2005 to 2018. And another one is like a website in which there are contained all the ransomware attacks that uh, uh, that attackers uh, did in the in the last years. Mm, matching those data set, we obtain a list of companies and all the attacks that, that they received in the considered time period, that is from 2005 to 2022. Now, what we need is, uh, uh, for every of these companies, we need uh, the maturity, the complexity, and the attractiveness, uh, attractiveness uh, indexes that we, we have seen before uh, to uh, test uh, the magic approach. Obviously, uh, we were not able to assess rigorously these indexes because this means that we should have known uh, all the organization, all the technological infrastructures of the organization, all the information systems. So we uh, obtained, we searched for some data uh, on the literature, and uh, we uh, relied on uh, AppGuard, that is uh, a website that uh, um, analyzes a lot of different companies, and they give for each company a security score that they um, say is a score calculated considering the externally facing assets of the companies, the network security, the reputation, and the mail security. So we uh, connected this security score given uh, by AppGuard to our maturity index. For the complexity instead, we consider the number of employees. We have said that it's not only this, we know it, but it is the uh, easiest information we, we could obtain. From the, from the internet and from the literature. And then for the attractiveness, we consider the business sector of, uh, of each uh, organization. Obviously, not all the companies that we had in the initial data set of the cyber attacks were analyzed by, by AppGuard. So we uh, connected these two uh, data sets and what we, we obtained is a new data set that contains all the companies all the maturity indexes, complexity indexes, and attractiveness, and the number of uh, attacks they received in the last years. This is uh, an example of the, of the data set. So as we were saying, there is the company ID, we epsilonized it, and the maturity, the complexity, the attractiveness, and the number of incidents. Uh, if you want to take a look, uh, we uh, made the, the data set available on GitHub. So uh, from a first analysis, we have seen that for security scores, we have really a lot of different numbers because the, the security score can go from zero to 950. The number of employees also ranges between uh, a really low number, less than 10 to more than 100,000. The business sectors were 22 in total. So what we did to uh, prepare the data set for the machine learning, we parameterized each of these features uh, in order to limit the dispersion of the, of the features and uh, to be coherent with the magic approach. So we obtain a uh, maturity that, that goes from 0 to 10, complexity also from 0 to 10, and uh, the, for the attractiveness, a number between 1 and 5. So from this one that was the original data set, we obtain something like that. So really a, a less dispersed, uh, dispersed data set. So basically, this is the, um, the graph of the, of the model. As you see, it's really similar to, to the magic one. Uh, but we don't have the number of expected, uh, expected attacks. That is an advantage for us. So we have maturity, complexity, and attractiveness. And we uh, give all of them uh, as input to the machine learning algorithm. And what we obtain is two classes for risk. Uh, we obtain low risk and high risk classes. Low, risks, uh, low risk is a class defined as the companies that obtain less than three incidents, uh, and high risk for the companies that obtain, mm, were subjected to um, more than three, three incidents. So we divided the, the data set in a training set and a test set. It was like 80% and 20, uh, but the data set was pretty unbalanced. 
So to balance, uh, to balance the data set, to balance the training set, we applied the, the SMOD technique, and then we randomly generated 1,000 different training set and test set, and uh, tried different classifiers uh, and evaluated the, the average results. What we obtain is that the SVM is the uh, most effective classifier for, uh, for our, dat our data set. Uh, here there is the, uh, the um, confusion matrix with the true positive and true negative ratios. And we obtain uh, uh, an accuracy of 72%. I know it's not too high, but it's the best we, we could do it. Uh, as a case study, um, we uh, applied the model to three different uh, uh, healthcare companies that were present in the data set, so they are real companies. Uh, a small one, a medium one, and a, a larger one in terms of complexity. So for the first one, we had that this organization had, uh, has a maturity of four, a complexity of two, and the attractiveness is set to three because of the, of the healthcare sector, so it will be the same for, for all the three case studies. Uh, and we have seen that the uh, model correctly classifies the companies as class one, so low risk one. Uh, in fact, this company uh, was subjected only um, to one cyber incident. So what we see here is that despite the low maturity, so it's only four, and I remember it's, uh, I remind you it's from zero to 10, so it's pretty low. Um, thanks to the low complexity of the company, we obtain that the risk is low. Uh, we have tried to in, uh, increase the complexity and for complexity equal to five, so a medium complexity, the organization would be classified as high risk. So. Uh, basically, complexity is a crucial parameter uh, when we consider uh, risk. For the uh, medium organization, we had that in this case the maturity was pretty low, only two, and the complexity was five. In this case, the model uh, correctly classified the, the organization as high risk, and it was subjected to six incidents. And in this case, we see that the low maturity leads to the classification as high risk. Uh, and also in this case, we have tried to increase the maturity, and we have seen that for a maturity that is sufficient, so it's six, uh, and constant complexity, the predicted class would be low risk. So it is crucial also for the older organizations to uh, be mature enough and to apply the uh, cybersecurity controls. For the last case study is for larger organization. Uh, in this case, we have a maturity index of six and a complexity equal to eight. This was also classified as high risk and the, uh, this company obtained, uh, uh, suffered 13 incidents. And in this case, we noticed that even increasing the maturity, so up to, up to 10, uh, we obtained that the, uh, the organization remains classified as a high risk one. So, uh, this is, we, we do not know if it's uh, right or no, but we think that uh, uh, the fact that the complexity is not calculated, uh, like uh, it's calculated only considering the number of employees uh, can be a cause of this. So in conclusion, uh, we have some limitation, of course, uh, that, are, um, uh, that are related uh, to, to the data set. Um, but this approach seems to work, seems to be very practical, is fast, is easy to, to do for the companies. And this is not a comprehensive method for uh, assessing cyber risk, of course, but uh, it can still serve as a preliminary tool for an organization to know if they are, uh, exp they are a high risk class or, a low, or uh, they belong to a high risk class or a, or a low, low risk class. Uh, and can be like, the starting of a cyber risk management uh, procedure. Um, the considered case studies show that the model can be also used for uh, critical infrastructure as uh, the healthcare sector. And obviously in further works, we will aim to improving the, the results, to strengthen the, the, the data set and to, to increase the accuracy. So that's all, thank you for the attention. Thank you for the presentation. Are there any questions?
Okay, so let's start from the speaker. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, basically, uh, we think that the greatest limitation of this work is that the data set is a bit, uh, it's not so strong because we had uh, a few entries. We have like 600 companies. And moreover, uh, for example, we consider the indexes, uh, maturity indexes, complexity, and so on of this year, while the attacks maybe uh, happen 10 years ago. So this is the, the main limitation. Uh, what we are working on is like building a new data set. And so considering uh, every attack that happens now and considering what is the maturity, the complexity of the organization in that moment. And then so in a few years, maybe we can uh, obtain a better, uh, better data set and we can improve, uh, improve the results basically. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, let's go with the second question. Mine is more a uh, curiosity related. Uh, you did this change of passing from a probabilist, poor probabilistic approach with respect to the machine learning one since uh, there is difficulty to model uh, the prior of the number of uh, yeah. attack or uh, there are other reasons? Just if you can give this... Okay. Uh, yeah, this was like the, the first uh, issue that we addressed, uh, and this is the motivation we started working on machine learning, because it is pretty hard to uh, say, I expect to be subjected to 10 attacks, I don't know. So this is the main reason. Obviously, the um, probabilistic methods gives a better output, because it gives a probability, and we ob what we obtain here is only a classification, a rough uh, classification. But there are pros and cons for both approaches. Thank okay, you. Thank, thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. So now is the turn of Mara Scattolini, uh, who presents a work entitled Canonical Correlation Analysis of Transient EMG Data for, for Multi User Motion Intent Detection. The floor is yours, Mara. Thank you for the introduction. I'm Mara Scattolini, a PhD student from Università Politecnica delle Marche, and it's a pleasure to be here to present our work. Just to introduce the concept, we are talking about the pattern recognition problems, and it is well known from the literature that the surface electromyography has a really important role for the pattern recognition problems and mainly for the recognition of the wrist movements of the hand and the fingers in general. So for this reason, the most studied uh, muscles are those belonging to the forearm and to the wrist in general. However, it has also uh, been noticed that there is another important joint, that is the shoulder joint, that however has been less studied with respect to the wrist, for example, due to its high complexity. However, the shoulder joint has a relevant role regarding the uh, development of assistive upper limb devices, in particular if what is considered is the transient epoch of the electromyographic signal. In fact, uh, in common pattern recognition problems, uh, what is uh, the data that are included in the study are, um, are, given, are taken from the, uh, from the entire movement. So we're talking about some seconds of movement. Well, instead, uh, when we talk about transient epochs, it means that we are focusing on data belonging to very short time, time windows of some hundreds of milliseconds. And uh, it is, so it means that we would like to recognize the movement just from its early beginning, so before it is actually concluded. Um, this is really important because uh, if an assistive device is able to recognize a certain movement just from the beginning of it, it could uh, help uh, to, uh, the, the user that needs that device to complete efficiently the movement. Thus, in this way, um, the patient would be encouraged in uh, increasing acceptance of the device that he or she needs 
And also, uh, since we are working on very short time window, um, on short time windows, uh, it could be possible also to think about uh, real time usage of the uh, device itself. Unfortunately, what is um, uh, a big issue is related to the intersubject variability, uh, to the intersubject problem. In the literature, the studies that are on the shoulder MID recognition are mainly intersubject. So it means that the model is uh, built, trained, and then tested on data belonging all to the same subject. So it's extremely subject specific. And this could discourage the patient in, the, um, in using that device because a long adaptation, adaptation session would be required when we want to adapt that model to another different user. So for this reason nowadays, the tendency is to move toward the user-independent approach in a way that we could, um, we could define the model uh, from in, on data belonging to different subjects, but that then it could be general. So it could be applied to any other different subjects, so reducing a lot the adaptation session and so favoring the acceptance of the device. However, there is a big obstacle in doing this, which is the high variability that exists among different subjects that are also performing exactly the same movement. So for this reason, the main aim of our work is to investigate the possibility to define a framework for multi-user shoulder MID problem. And for the purpose, we used an online available data set which consisted of EMG data extracted from eight healthy subjects and from eight uh, surface electromyographic probes uh, placed around on the shoulder muscles of the, of the subjects. And each subject was performing four different shoulder movements, each of them repeated nine times. Then, after an initial filtering of the signal, we identified the motion, intent detection, the motion intent detection window, so the very short time window that I was talking before, and the length of the short time window was about 300 milliseconds, and in order to define it, we used the, the, the kinematic signal of the shoulder joint. From it, we identified the exact onset, more or less, of the uh, of the movement and then we, um, we pick up 150 milliseconds before and 150 milliseconds after that movement. So we focus our window on the early beginning of the movement and um, so we consider this a 300 milliseconds window, which is this short window in, uh, in pink. And uh, um, then from we perform a further segmentation of that window using two different uh, window lengths. Uh, 50 milliseconds and 150 milliseconds with an overlap of 50%. And on this uh, 10 windows, so we extracted four times the main features, which are the main absolute value, the waveform length, the zero crossing, and the slope sign change. Then we um, apply the canonical correlation analysis, or CCA. The CCA is a technique that is able to maximize the correlation between two different feature matrices that are related to the same object. Um, through the definition, the computation of two projection matrices that are able to project the two original feature matrices into a new space where they are maximally correlated among each other and uh, simplifies the more generalized form um, of the CCA is trying to solve the least square problem. And this is also what we employed in our in our work. Before defining the framework, we divided the feature set, we split it into two subsets, which is the calibration subset that at the beginning included only one repetition for each trial, while all the remaining repetitions were, were included inside the training subset. Also, the subjects were divided into three groups. One was uh, um, worked as the expert user, another one as the testing user, and the third one was, um, was the training subject. At the beginning, in the training set was included only one subject, and then it was increased the number of subjects progressively up to uh, the maximum possible in this work, which was six. And here we have the, um, the experimental framework. So as I was saying, it is focused on the application of the CCA. In particular, the calibration subset of each user were 
correlated with the calibration subset of the X per user through the CCA. And then the, um, the computed projection matrix was applied to the training subset of the, of the other user that was not the expert user. This correlation with the expert was performed uh, for all the subjects belonging to the training set. And then they were, once they were projected in the new space, they were concatenated horizontally one to each other. And then um, a dimensionality reduction approach through the spectral regression was applied in order to, um, to obtain a reduced global matrix that will be used for, the, um, for training the classifier. Exactly the same procedure was applied for the, um, for the, for the subset of the expert user. The only difference is that uh, we do not have the concatenation with the other users since the final matrix that we obtained was left apart for testing the classifier. For the classification, we employed a support vector machine, uh, which was so um, trained on the reduced global training subset, and then it was tested, as I was saying before, on the reduced training subset of the uh, testing user, and then the classification of the four different movements was obtained. Each subject in turn worked as expert user, as testing user, and then um, also the number of trials included into the calibration subset was increased progressively, as well as the number of subjects for the training subset. Um, the very first results uh, regards so the effect of the application of the LSCCA. So we combined all together the training subset um, or the training subset of the different subjects. And uh, here it can be seen that actually without the application of the framework, uh, there, is, uh, uh, many, there are many zones in which the, uh, the four different classes are overlapping one to each other. So a clear distinction was not possible. Instead, after we applied the presented framework, we noticed that, that uh, uh, there is the separation among the four classes uh, was highlighted by, um, by the application of the CCA, even if uh, we were putting all together different subjects, uh, um, different subjects so that uh, are uh, different among each other. And here we reported the uh, classification accuracy, which was the index used for uh, quantified performance of the classifier as a function of the, an increasing number of trials used for the calibration. While each curve represents the, um, the different num different, a different number of subjects used for the training, they are all referring with the application of the, uh, the LSCCA-based framework, except for this almost a straight line um, at the bottom, which is that refers to um, the inclusion of six subjects in the training subset, but without the LSCCA. So, and as it can be seen, independently from the number of trials that are considered, actually the classification accuracy without the application of the framework uh, remains always uh, very low, around 25%. Differently is that with the application of the presented framework, there is a general increasing trend into the classification accuracy. Um, and this was uh, noticed for both windows, so, so for a 150 milliseconds window and for a 50 milliseconds window. This is important because it means that we are able to achieve high accuracy, res high accuracy results also using a smaller window, such as the 50 milliseconds window, which could uh, give us a possible uh, applicability into the real time, uh, into the real time scenario. So to make fi some final remarks, uh, we, we can say that uh, reliable results were obtained for the multi-user MID problem through the, um, through the defined framework. And uh, thanks to the fact also that the CCA was able to highlight the separation among the different classes, even if different subjects uh, were uh, put all together. And the classification accuracy was improved both using a higher number of trials for the calibration subset and a higher number of subjects for the training. And as I was saying before, another important result is related to the uh, very short time window of 50 milliseconds that could give us uh, possible relevance for real time applications. Thank you.
Any questions? the data so as a do you mean the, the proper data set yeah. we do not collect the data but it's something that is available online oh, okay. and uh, we decided to use this online because this is a preliminary study so we we prefer to use yeah but in the future we could uh, think about to collect uh, data in our laboratory I did not get to your point, sir. Uh, if you plan to collect the, the mm -hmm. data yourself, yeah. uh, do you plan to make a uh, multiple kind of measure? Because uh, maybe in the baseline, so the, the patient has a low rate and uh, has an activity. Okay. Maybe after an uh, activity where the, the muscle response is different, do you plan to be I think that collect the baseline could be a reasonable choice, but we have to plan it. Thank you. Okay, uh, the next speaker uh, is Antonio Nocera from Università Politecnica di Marche with the study entitled uh, Working Pattern Identification of FMCW Rather Database on a Combined CNN and LSTM Approach. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. <coughs> okay, I'm Antonio, a PhD student uh, in the Department of Information Engineering at Università Politecnica delle Marche, and today I'm presenting to you a deep learning approach applied to walking pattern identification coming from radar data. Now, in the last few years, radar data has been used in so many applications, uh, for example, vital sign estimation, fall detection, gesture recognition, as, and as in this case, gate analysis. The reason why automotive radars um, have the potential to be uh, sensor devices in human-machine interaction is due to their contact, contactless nature, so they do not need any wearable, any sensor placed on the body on the, uh, of the subject. They are powered by data-driven models because the output of a radar acquisition is an image, so all the computer vision field models that are extensively validated on image data set can be used and they are pretty precise and versatile. Uh, we can change the configuration parameter of a radar to change the distance resolution and its velocity resolution. So our aim is to classify six different walking patterns acquired, uh, recorded with a frequency modulated continuous wave radar. The data set is actually publicly uh, available and our uh, group uh, work on it and uh, recorded six different, these six different activities, fast walk, slow walk, slow walk while, hands, uh, while the hands were in pocket, um, walking, hiding, a metallic battle, a simulated limping walk, and a walk with swinging hands. The experimental protocol was the same, so we had a radar in a room with a maximum distance of 10 meters, and we instructed the subject to walk in a straight path and with one single turn. Now the device we used <coughs> is an automotive radar. So it's a pretty simple device with one transmitter and four receivers antenna. Now a radar works by transmitting the so-called chirp signal, which is an electromagnetic wave. And this radar works in frequency modulated continuous wave, which means that the chirp that is transmitted as a frequency that increases linearly with time, as we see in, the, uh, in this plot, okay? So it transmits the electromagnetic wave in the volume measurement and waits for the response from, uh, from this volume measurement. So all the objects <coughs> will interact with this chirp, but also the subject. And after a certain delay of time, we will see the received chirp. Now actually, we are working on the so-called intermediate frequency signal, which is the convolution between the two, transmitted and received 
chirp whose frequency is related to this delay and so to the distance of each object. Now, we, uh, we set as a parameter this train of impulses, this train of uh, 128 chirps, which form one single frame. So this is an example of the intermediate frequency signal we are working with. It's a complex signal, and we are rearranging this signal in a 2D matrix. Okay? This, is, this is just one single frame. We have the fast time samples uh, along the, the rows. Those are just the ADC sampling of the intermediate frequency signal. And then we have the 128 chirps, uh, called also slow time, along the columns. Now we can apply the, the standard radar signal processing is a 2D FFT, an FFT along a fast Fourier transform. So an FFT along the column gives us information about distance or range, and an FFT along the, the rows gives us an information about velocity. In this case, we exploit the so-called Doppler effect. So each time we uh, give an impulse to the volume measurement and this impulse interacts with a moving object, the phase will slightly change, and the frequency by which it changes well, can be seen with an FFT. This is an example of what we find, and the echo here is a subject walking at around 5 meter and 1.5 1, 1 uh, uh, meter per second. Now those are some examples. Uh, compressed along the time dimension, along the frames dimension, so it's just a velocity time map. But we can see that for the different walking patterns, we see some differences in the image. Okay. Now actually we have 400 frames, so it's like a video. For each frame we have a distance velocity map, and we want to, um, we want to classify this video. And so we can use some deep learning approach already available uh, and working on video. We apply a CNN to each single um, distance velocity map, so the single frame, to extract a feature vector. And then we exploit the third dimension, the time dimension, with a recurrent neural network, in this case a bidirectional long and short time memory, uh, as a classifier. <laughs> So the feature extractor, in this case, we, uh, we choose uh, Google Net. It's a state-of-art net. It's a pretty large net, actually, with a two, 22 layers. We augment the data by a factor of four because we have four receiving antennas that works independently. The total number of frames we are working with is, uh, are uh, 322,000 uh, frames. Actually, the Google Net is fine-tuned on an average of half these frames in a fourfold cross validation manner. So we have 75% training, of which, of which then 25% uh, is a no doubt validation uh, set for hyperparameter tuning, and then 25% test for performance evaluation. The classifier is uh, a simple uh, one layer uh, bidirectional LSTM. We work with the same fourfold cross validation and a threefold internal cross validation with a grid search for hyperparameter tuning. Here we see some tuned parameters. To prevent possible over overfitting, we adopt an early stopping criterion and also a dropout layer after the B LSTM layer. Now, th those are some results on the full acquisition. Here we see the confusion matrix um, summed across all the faults. We see that the number of mistakes are pretty small, and they are all uh, across the slow walk, fast walk, hands in pocket, so normal, the normal walking patterns. And if we observe uh, across the faults, well, the accuracy is always higher uh, than 90%, and the abnormal walking patterns, so the last three, that at the F1 score was always 100%. So, we tried to see what happened with smaller observing window size. Uh, obviously, there is a clear drop in accuracy, but we see that the uh, first three classes, which are the abnormal walking pattern class, well, they are um, classified pretty accurately, whereas the main problem, the main issues, 
are with the normal working classes. So let's see for 65 frames what happens. Uh, 65 frames is a 2.6 second uh, observing window. And we compare it with 3D Open, which is a CNN-based state of art, which works with the same amount of frames. Here we see a recall confusion matrix with our results in red. Uh, the results are uh, lower than the 3D open uh, in terms of recall, and in green, our results are higher than the, uh, well, better than the 3D open. And as we can see, the 3D open is generally better, <laughs> um, but we are better for the abnormal class. And if we observe well, all the mistakes that our model uh, does uh, are either confined with the normal walking class or the abnormal walking class. So for 2.6 seconds, the uh, classifier is a perfect abnormal pattern discriminator. Now, uh, there are a lot of methods in the literature. The first, the first one were uh, traditional machine learning methods, so SVM, K-means, and they tackled the two class scenario, slow walk, and fast walk, or the three, uh, three class scenario, slow walk, fast walk, has in pocket. And we see that for the two class scenario, we have pretty high accuracy and a drop in the three class scenario. And for the three class scenario, actually, uh, we achieved pretty high accuracy and a consistent drop in accuracy f with um, smaller uh, observing windows, but all these accuracy are higher than the traditional machine learning. When compared to the 3D open, actually, we do not achieve the same amount of accuracy if we see for the six class scenario, well, if we give the full acquisition, we obtain 95.6%, but for the same amount of frames, we obtain 85.2%. So we have some advantages and disadvantages, obviously applying a feature vector uh, that is a deep learning uh, a deep learning convolutional neural network. We, don't, we do not need any added preprocessing step. We are using all the three dimension of the radar cube. And also, the network can be used for any window size. We actually train the network on, all the, on the full acquisition. And then we test it for smaller observing window. We see that the, uh, our classifier is a perfect abnormal classifier with two to three gate cycle, and it achieves 89% accuracy for classes with around eight gate cycles, and 95% accuracy with 12 to 16 seconds. Obviously, it's a complex model when compared to other state-of-art approaches. There is no interpretability, uh, and there is an evident drop in accuracy for small uh, observation window. Also, there are some problems with the data set, it's pretty small, and the abnormal class have a small number of, ex, uh, of examples. So future direction could involve some data augmentation techniques to improve accuracy, reduce the complexity of the network, and even uh, try to monitor multiple people at the same time, because we have also this possibility with the radar. Uh, thank you for the attention. Yeah, uh, I actually didn't test other, <laughs> like an LSTM or a standard uh, GRU, um, yeah. Um, I tried with first with the BLSTM because I see that mm, well, it has mm, higher accuracy usually compared with LSTM, uh, just an LSTM, thanks to the fact that we consider both the chronological order and anti-chronological order. Just for this reason, uh, I use the BLSTM, but probably using LSTM as a comparison would be better, surely.
just a curiosity. Um, okay, have you in mind some way to make more shallow the the model? Since it is, uh, it it's, seems a, a complex, yeah. and um, I appreciate a lot the the analysis you do with the reducing the frames. Uh, uh, do you believe that reducing the frame, the computation of the double dimension FFT becomes more noisy, so it could, uh, in some sense, add noise to the to the network? Uh, just these two. Uh, actually, it could be it could be the case that reducing the observation window, the FFT is less effective. Uh, I didn't think about <laughs> about it actually. Uh, to to reduce complexity, I would like to use. For example, post-pruning techniques, I could increase sparsity of the model. So, for example, excluding some kernels, because we are actually okay. We are using a Google Net pre-trained on ImageNet, so we are fine-tuning the Google Net. Probably just the first few layers are important, because those first few layers, what well, concerns with the general feature extract um, extraction. So, for example, the general shape, the lines, the colors, the patterns. Probably the last few layers are not so important. So probably I could eliminate the last few layers with, uh, for example, a magnitude score analysis. Uh, I would like to do so. Yeah. Thank you again. Thank you. Okay, now it's uh, time for coffee break, and then we restart at 12.10. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we can restart the session. So now is the turn of um, Agnese Piersanti, uh, who presents uh, a study entitled uh, a machine learning framework based on continuous glucose monitoring to prevent the occurrence of exercise-induced hypoglycemia in children with type 1 diabetes. The floor is yours. Hello everyone, I am Agnese Pierzanti from the Department of uh, Information Engineering at the Università Politecnica delle Marche. And the work I'm going to present has been done in collaboration with the CNR Institute of Neuroscience of Padua and the Medical University of Vienna. Uh, first of all, let's introduce what uh, diabetes and uh, type 1 diabetes in particular is. Diabetes is a chronic metabolic disease characterized by the inability of the body to properly use or produce insulin, which is a hormone devoted to the regulation of blood glucose levels. In particular, type 1 diabetes uh, is characterized by the autoimmune deterioration of pancreatic beta cells, that are the cells who secrete insulin. So, uh, the poor insulin secretion or completely absent insulin secretion of type 1 diabetic patient uh, rise blood glucose levels uh, toward a condition known as hyperglycemia which is uh, associated to many diabetes complications, both micro and uh, microvascular. Uh, thus, the primary therapy in type 1 diabetes uh, consists in the exogenous administration of insulin, together with, of course, blood glucose monitoring and uh, conducting a healthy lifestyle. However, daily insulin injection or uh, administration through microinfusion uh, can cause uh, blood glucose to drop under critical levels. This condition is known as hypoglycemia and uh, it is uh, a risky condition uh, that is also associated with coma. Uh, physical exercise is uh, uh, now introduced in uh, the management of type 1 diabetes since uh, it uh, was shown to improve cardiovascular health and glycemic control maintaining a good fitness and healthy body weight and composition, and also psychosocial well-being. This is particularly important in the specific population of children and adolescents um, with type 1 diabetes, since for them the recommendation of physical exercise are the same used for healthy children, of at least one hour or mo of moderate or vigorous intensity physical activity per day. 
However, physical exercise is known to increase the risk of hypoglycemia that can occur both during and after uh, the start of the exercise session. This phenomenon is known as uh, exercise-induced hypoglycemia and discourage the uh, patient in uh, uh, engaging the proper uh, physical activity. Uh, continuous glucose monitoring are devices that can uh, help uh, in this field because uh, this, uh, this technology allows to uh, sample interstitial glucose and to uh, uh, transmit it to a receiver uh, that could be, for example, the smartphone of the patient or uh, the clinician that can see um, glucose level uh, across the time. Uh, moreover, it can give alerts of impending hypo and hyperglycemia and can be used in uh, uh, addition to automated in to insulin delivery algorithms and uh, insulin pumps in order to adjust automatically the insulin therapy. However, these technologies are still not effective in uh, preventing exercise-induced hypoglycemia. Machine learning uh, represents a powerful tool to um, predict uh, hypoglycemia, in particular the task uh, in the literature for the prediction of hypoglycemia is mainly uh, starting from raw continuous glucose monitoring data, while in this work uh, our idea was to apply classification starting from matrix extracted from the signal before the start of exercise in order to predict, uh, to capture characteristics that can help in the prediction of hypoglycemia occurring after uh, exercise or during the exercise session. Uh, so the aim was to propose a machine learning framework based on CGM metrics to prevent the occurrence of exercise-induced hypoglycemia in children with type 1 diabetes. The data that we use are freely available from a um, group that is the direct uh, net uh, group and pertain to 50 children with type 1 diabetes who underwent a 75 minute of standardized exercise session wearing a Medtronic MidiMed CGM sensor uh, which samples interstitial glucose every 5 minutes. Um, so each uh, recording pertaining to each different sub subject was split into portions. The pre-exercise data portion, which was the portion preceding the start of exercise, was used for feature extraction, while the post-exercise data portion, following the start of exercise until the following morning, was used for hypoglycemia screening, that means uh, for the labeling of um, uh, the CGM recording as a hypo if the subject experienced hypoglycemia after exercise or no hypo if subject did not experience any hypoglycemia. The threshold chosen was 60 mg per deciliter. So the features included in the dataset were both anthropometric char characteristics and 43 uh, continuous glucose monitoring metrics which were extracted with an R package, iGlue, or through custom-made R functions. In particular, we choose iGlue since from our work, uh, a recent work by our group, we investigated different software packages and tools for the um, analysis of CGM data and this one resulted uh, the best trade-off between the highest number of computable metrics and also the reliability of the computed metrics that accounted for different properties such as classical descriptive uh, statistics, metrics of hypo or hypoglycemia, glycemic control and glycemic variability and also composite metrics uh, which uh, encompass uh, more than one of these uh, uh, properties. The problem was, of course, classification between uh, hypoclass versus the no hypoclass. Feature selection was carried out in two steps. One step was the filter type selection that was used to investigate some collinearities among features and was uh, addressed through point biserial correlation to class. Uh, so in uh, such a way that the one showing the highest color relation with the target uh, was the retained uh, feature and the other was discarded. And then uh, we used intrinsic, intrinsic type feature selection based on a decision tree uh, 
uh, for the final uh, for obtain uh, the final um, feature set. Uh, this was fairly evaluated then uh, in um, giving it as input to three other uh, models that were uh, the random forest, other boost and gradient boosting. Uh, the tuning of the parameters was performed during training and then we validated through only one subject out cross validation. Uh, so, going to the results, a total of 47 CGM recordings were included uh, in the analysis. Each of them was pertaining to a different subject, accounting for a total of 12,000, almost 12,000 glucose data points. Uh, we obtained 34 uh, for, um, samples for the hypo class and 13 for the no-hypo. As we can see from the figure, that is a lasagna plot, uh, that uh, in a color grid uh, can show you the levels of glycemia for each single subject on the left and sorted the version on the right, we can see some differences between the two classes. For example, the fact that in the pre-exercise phase, the hypo class uh, show the uh, highest number of low values for the glycemia that are represented in blue. So, uh, the selected feature at, at the end, the most informative ones were for the M value, which usually indicates better glycemic control, but in our case was associated with hypoglycemia. And the three metrics um, that are associated with hyperglycemia. This is also not expected since uh, they are associated to hyper and not to hypoglycemia. Um, okay, this format, uh, these three metrics are, um, one is the maximum of glucose and the other two are two common uh, thresholds for uh, definition of hyperglycemia. Uh, among them, the M value have had the highest uh, statistical significant difference between the two classes. Uh, so, talking about performances, uh, mm, the one that showed the best performances, of course, uh, as, as ex expected, is the decision tree, since uh, it was used also for uh, feature selection, but then uh, the results are uh, almost quite, quite good also for the other three uh, models used, as we also can be seen from the receiver operating characteristics. Uh, the lowest performances uh, were in the specificity, maybe due to the class imbalance, and this is uh, seen in uh, all the models. And then we um, compared our results also with the state of art, so uh, with the study um, in similar, sesh, um, similar conditions uh, performed by Redi et al., uh, which uh, also used the decision tree achieving similar or lower performances in the training phase. So we compared with the, their, uh, their validation um, uh, re uh, results. They then improved their, uh, uh, their performances, but they do this with the use of uh, other measures that are, for example, heart rate and uh, hormone therapy measures which is uh, something that we would not uh, um, add to our study, maybe because uh, adding uh, measurement to our type 1 diabetic patients uh, is uh, not well tolerated. Uh, moreover, another difference is that uh, we extracted features uh, uh, in a window that precede the exercise until five hours before, so with a prediction horizon that is more uh, broad, while in their case uh, the features were extracted immediately at the start of exercise. So the main novelties were applying machine learning not on raw CGM data but on a data set uh, based on um, CGM metrics that ensure interpretability and uh, the use of common metrics um, that are used in clinical care in a different way since we computed them in a different time window which maybe can explain the fact that uh, uh, for example, the M value that is associated with uh, poor control in this case uh, was uh, associated with hypoglycemia. Uh, of course, the low number of subjects uh, could be a problem, but comparable with the one uh, by Red et al. And also, uh, we stress the fact that uh, we used uh, many data points, so many glucose points uh, uh, for the analysis. 
uh, the data set unbalance um, was uh, also something that uh, we noticed, but uh, we choose to train the model on that since uh, it reflects a real world scenario. In indeed, uh, hypoglycemia is likely to occur in a population with type 1 diabetes. So at the end, the proposed study um, is a machine learning framework based on CGM data to prevent the occurrence of exercise-induced hypoglycemia in children with type 1 diabetes. And this information may be useful if uh, we like uh, to, to suggest preventive action uh, in order to avoid this hypoglycemia. This preventive action, for, for example, can be eating a snack before or during uh, the exercise or adjusting the medication regimens and can be um, uh, added in uh, open loop, uh, like for example in a decision support system um, with the patient or in closed loop, uh, giving it as input uh, to, for example, automated insulin delivery uh, systems. Future studies will examine a real-world scenario, so not uh, in a standardized exercise condition, but uh, in free living condition. Since we are now uh, using uh, a, no, a new data set uh, of about 500 subjects, and uh, we will see if these results uh, are confirmed or not. Thank you. Are there any questions from the audience? Okay, no, I have uh, one question. Um, I saw that uh, you trained the models including also uh, the anthropo anthropometric characteristics of the, of the children. Have you tested the possibility to train the model with and without, so with, okay, is already what you have done, but without since uh, what I had in mind is that uh, since I saw that there are significance, for instance, the body mass index and so on, um, they could be as the, the, the model uh, avoiding a real effect uh, for the prediction of, um, of this event, hypoglycemia event uh, due to the sensor. So perhaps uh, if uh, you believe that they can uh, a little bit produce a more uh, over-optimistic view uh, or, or over-optimistic results. So I your point of view regarding this. Thank you for the question. Yes, I think that this could be, could affect the results actually. Mm, and usually uh, we did something that is um, used uh, in the literature, so adding these uh, characteristics. Uh, for example, when you use uh, decision support systems um, uh, they usually require the patients with type 1 diabetes uh, to uh, introduce in the decision system this uh, kind of uh, information. Uh, but uh, yes, of course, maybe um, for um, yeah, like to, to improve also the performances because I think that this could affect uh, in uh, a way that we don't know if maybe something, some of the results are related to this. But um, I think that uh, we could also improve the performances if uh, we split, uh, so if we train the model with um, a particular set of subjects that is more similar in this uh, kind of uh, anthropometric characteristics and not only on this, because for example, um, when we will um, try with um, daily living conditions, we will uh, uh, split uh, the different uh, type of exercise uh, also, so we will have to train, uh, I think, uh, the model uh, in different uh, steps for each, uh, each kind of these differences. Okay, thank you again, Agnese, for your work. Okay, uh, we continue with the next speaker, who is uh, Rami Mubarak from Università Politecnica delle Marche. And um, uh, he presents a work entitled Toward a Minimal SEMG Setup for Knee and Ankle Kinematic Estimation During Gait. The floor is yours, Rami. Thank you, Andrea, for uh, the introduction of our recent work. Uh, regarding the background of uh, our 
project is uh, I'd like to mention that the continuous estimation of kinematic parameter parameters is crucial in the operation of rehabilitation devices and assistive robotics. And one of the most important techniques used in this field is the surface electromyography, SEMG. And why? Because it's a non-invasive technique that thus allows easy application and is a low-cost technology, giving the reach to a wider cohort of users. It's also, it also su carries sufficient information content, uh, making it reliable in the operation. And one of its most important merits that it arises 10 to 100 milliseconds before the full motion development, thus allows to predict the uh, to early predict the motion and allows a, no, a smooth natural movement of the operated processes. Thus, a minimal setup that we want to achieve will further reduce the cost and complexity of the bioelectrical interfaces. There are two main approaches followed in literature. One is the Pascal skeletal modeling that is called model-based approach. Uh, it uh, requires a lot of physical uh, functional, a prior knowledge of physical functional relationship between the surface electromyography and the joints, uh, thus requiring a subject specific uh, parameters and constraint setting, making the whole solution complex and challenging. The other approach is the data-driven or model-free approach that does not require prior knowledge of the physical uh, relationships, thus offering less restrictions in terms of parameters and constraints. Instead, it maps the input surface electromyography signals or features into the desired and estimated angle in, in the context of a black box mapping functions. And among the most used learning algorithms in literature from that context are the neural networks, NN. But also, it lacks the theoretical basis for select selection of the neural network structures, like the number of flyers and the initial weights of the neurons. It also has some uh, issues of overfitting and has the risk of convergence toward the local minimum. This was overcome by the development of the support vector machines, or the so-called SVM, that converge always a global minima, thus giving a unique solution. It's also robust in nonlinear optimization since it involves convex optimization solution and it uses kernels to convert the input features that might be nonlinearly related into higher dim dimension where the linear regression is possible to be achieved. It was further developed, developed into the least square support vector machines, the LSVM, LSSVM. It solves equality constraints instead of inequality ones and it eventually solves sets of linear equations, thus reducing the computational cost. In the previous studies, some researchers used a redundant number of surface electromyography probes. For example, some used seven electrodes from lower limb muscles. Others combined them with four inertial, inertial sensors. Other researchers also combined the surface electromyography with insole pressure and hip joint trajectories. So the whole aim of this study is to achieve a minimal setup by using only two SEMG probes recorded from the shank muscles, specifically in this study are the tibialis anterior TA and the gastrocnemius lateralis GAL, to and evaluating their separate use and combined use as input to the machine learning algorithm that we use. To, and to, we want to investigate the, the performance of the LSSVM model using three different kernels that are the linear, polynomial, and radial basis function. In the experimental procedure of this study, a total of six healthy subjects was participated at the Laboratory of Movement and Analysis in Universite Politecnica delle Marche. Uh, their uh, SEMG, two SM, SEMG probes were, were used to record the shank uh, muscle activity and sampled at one kilohertz. Optoelectronic system with eight infrared cameras was used to capture the trajectory, marker, marker trajectories and sampled at 250 hertz. The subjects walked over five meters walkway back and forth repeatedly for 12 times until they achieved a total of 72 gate cycles. The collected surface electromyography signals were then band pass filtered uh, between the cutoff frequencies of 30 and 450 hertz. Instead, the collected markers were low-pass low filtered using a fourth-order Butterworth with a cutoff frequency of 9 Hz according to residual-based analysis. Then, 
their data was used to reconstruct the kinematic trajectories while the uh, electromyography, surface electromyography were feature extracted using a window size of 200 milliseconds and overlapping window or sliding increment of fo uh, 40 milliseconds. While the uh, reconstructed kinematics were downsampled by a factor of 10 to ensure the synchronization between the two data. data. Then they were fed to the LSSVM models using the three different kernels for training and then testing to predict the angles. In the scheme of training and testing, 50% of the data of each subject was used for training the model and followed a scheme of tenfold cross validation for the hyperparameters tuning. The rest of the 50% the 50 was used for testing. So we have our, the LSSVM model using three different kernels and with each kernel, we fit the model with either the separate use of the muscles or the combined use of the muscles. So we end up with nine different models using the different combinations of kernels and inputs. It's important to highlight here that the metrics used for the evaluation of the performance where the coefficient of determination, R squared, and the RMSE, uh, the root mean square error for the uh, accuracy or robustness of the model. And instead, the R squared was for the goodness of fit. We have, if we want to have uh, an, uh, a visual view of, of, of the results, we can look at the estimated and the actual trajectories using, on the right figure, the two muscles together. Uh, we can see in the blue lines the actual ankle trajectory and in orange the uh, actual knee trajectory. Instead, in the black, we can see the estimated ones. On the left, we see the one that is estimated uh, using only the tibialis anterior as input. We can see that the figure on the right, the black uh, curve, is uh, consistently and well aligned with the actual one. Instead, if we look on the left, we can see, especially in the estimation of the knee using the, t the TA muscle, a lot of uh, irregular spikes and <coughs> random regions that appear and hide in the signal. This was confirmed objectively by the using of the R square that we can see that the estimation of the ankle uh, trajectory using the only the gal muscle has resulted in R square that is higher than 0.8, and in the estimation of the knee trajectory resulted in R, R square of higher than 0.7 using the radial base function because the radial base function uh, verified its superior performance according to the R square figures. Uh, also, the uh, tibialis anterior, in its best case, has resulted in R square that is less than 0.6. It's also important here to mention that the polynomial and the radial basis function outperformed the linear uh, kernel because uh, the linear kernel uh, resulted in R squared that is lower than 0.7 for uh, the ankle and lower than 0.5 for the knee. If we look at, at the figures of RMSC uh, using only the radial basis uh, function, uh, kernel, basis function kernel, uh, we can see also that the gal muscle has resulted in median RMSE that is lower than 5 degrees for the ankle and lower than 8 degrees for the knee. Instead, the TA muscle uh, has resulted in a 12 degrees of RMSE for estimating the knee. But using both the muscles has, has, has provided slightly better but comparable results with using the gal only. This improvement for the estimation of the ankle joint is justified due to the functional relationship between both of the muscles and the ankle flexion extension during gait. And the interesting thing that the estimation of the, the knee was also uh, the knee trajectory was also improved using uh, the, both the muscles, while the TA is not functionally related to the knee joint. But they are antagonist muscles, and we tested their paired correlation coefficients between them, and it was not greater than minus 0.34. Thus, it suggests that they give a wider complementary features that uh, improve the estimation of targets. The results of our, our research verify the reliability of this method for, to be tested for walking instead of a lot of other studies that implemented only using the treadmill or uh, sit-to-stand activities. Uh, it also verifies the robustness of this method for a long series of gait cycles that because it was tested for 36 gait cycles in each trial, uh, unlike other studies which implemented few strides. 
One important thing about the kernel is that the linear kernels has outperformed the linear kernel, and this is reasonable due to the nonlinear relationship between the surface electromyography and the uh, joint angles. Thus, we can conclude that a minimal number of EMG sensors can provide comparable results to using uh, more probes, like in other studies. This confirms the importance of mus muscle selection in this kind of applications that might be done when possible based on the functional relationship between the muscles and the joint. But if that is not possible, then it might be selected uh, depending on the potential relationship between the muscle activity and the different states or phases of the gait. Thank you for your attention, and uh, we are looking forward that there is a possible question. Thank you, Rami. Are there any questions from the audience? I have a question. Please. Uh, time domain features that are uh, the mean absolute value, the root mean square, and uh, the most common as you're crossing the most common time domain features. Thank you for the question. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I was wondering if you um, compared uh, your root mean square error uh, with uh, literature studies, for example. Uh -oh, uh, uh, thank you for your question. As I concluded that uh, our minimal number of our use of minimal number of AMG electrodes provided comparable results to when more uh, sensors were used in previous studies. Although we did not report a direct comparison in the paper, but uh, if you return to the references, ref cited the references, you can see that the RMSC uh, uh, values are very comparable to our uh, to other studies that used uh, a redundant number of uh, SEMG electrodes to estimate the same uh, target trajectories. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ramir. non c'è sul tempo sul texto non so giusto allora è avanti no devi andare su conferenze conferenze si 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 sull'altro profilo perché noi quando siamo arrivati qua c'era conferenza abbiamo chiesto se andava bene e ho detto di sì ecco perché non trovo i video Questo è quello che è... 
questo è un light in questo qua allora prendo il microfono grazie così proviamo con bene al massimo così dobbiamo vedere con quella lì il microfono si ah ti dico proprio così finito anche di online non si va così la vertice no è gestito poi la fai con la si si sentivano non è un time su chat cioè mm -hmm. questo si riesce a collegare qua tutto era, era online la, la ragazza si sì, però dice questo è questo è time giusto se sì, noi siamo anche alla maglia da lì rie, riesce sì, Sir Leif, are you able to hear us now? Ok, un attimo, aspetta, perché questo succede spesso, eh. eh Prova adesso con il microfono. Ah, già sta lì al tech, prova così. Now are you able? Cristo, dobbiamo lo parlare. Are you able now to hear us? Thank you. 
tenemos que usar. Sí, sí, se ha iluminado el blue. Are you able now to hear us? I can hear you. you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you, but uh, you are able to hear us or not? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Uh, we had problem with the recording of the of the, your video. Uh, could you uh, present online your uh, uh, the, the presentation you performed, or uh, have you some problems? in showing the slide and uh, give uh, uh, the talk. Uh, can I show the video? Yes. Because the presentation is not here with me right now, so I can show the video. Oh, perfect. If you can, it, for us it's better. Okay. Yes, we see everything. So, thank you very much. No problem. Can you see the video? Yes. Okay. Hello, my name is Edith Toprak and I am excited. to have this opportunity to share with you our research study that has been the investigation of physiological features by age groups in children with autism. As a PhD student at the Department of Electrical and Electronics Engineering at the University in Turkey, I have had the privilege of working alongside a brilliant team of researchers throughout this study. I would like to extend my gratitude and acknowledge the invaluable contributions of my esteemed colleagues, Tegi, Pet, Knar, Duygun and Hatice. Without further ado, let's dive into the details of our study. First, I would like to define the autism spectrum disorder. Autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder described by limited and restricted behaviors, lack of social abilities, and confined interests. Some individuals may require substantial support in their daily lives, while others may be highly skilled in certain areas and require less support. Emotional recognition in individuals with autism is important for facilitating social interactions, developing empathy, improving emotional regulation, guiding interventions and support, and promoting mental well-being. By addressing emotional recognition difficulties, we can help individuals with autism navigate the social world more effectively and improve their overall quality of life. For emotional recognition, several cues can be used, especially physiological signals such as blood volume impulse, skin conductance, or electrodermal activity and skin temperature. Although physiological signals are age-dependent parameters, there is no threshold or ground proof to use these physiological signals directly to understand the difference between the age groups. The aim of our study is to investigate the age dependencies of features extracted from physiological signals in children with autism during a child robot interaction. This study is the part of a project called EMBOA, which is effectively in social assisted robotics as an intervention tool for children with autism. The aim of the EMBOA project is to assess the viability of existing approaches and develop new strategy to strengthen the intervention for developing emotional intelligence in children with autism by establishing an effective loop in child robot interaction. Caspar is a child-sized human and a social robot interacts with children with autism. There are four different interaction scenarios that are performed with Caspar. Each scenario is based on the turn-taking, mimicry, and role-changing principles. Based on language comprehension and verbal knowledge of emotions, animals, and bodily parts are needed for these interaction scenarios. Blood volume pulse, 
dormant activity and skin temperature data were acquired from the children with autism via empatica e before risk factor. In this study, BVP, EDA, ST signals were analyzed. The BVP signal, which measures changes in blood volume in the microvascular system, provides information about cardiac activity and can be used to assess aspects such as heart rate variability and cardiovascular reactivity. The EDA signal, which reflects changes in sweat gland activity, is commonly used as an indicator of sympathetic nervous system activation and emotional arousal. Skin temperature, another parameter captured by E4, empathica E4 wristband, can be influenced by changes in blood flow and sympathetic nervous system activity. The analysis of BEP, EDA and ST data can contribute to our knowledge of how children with autism experience and respond to emotional and social situations partially leading to advancement in the diagnosis and treatment of autism. Inclusion criteria for the study were determined by Envo Consortium ensuring a standardized approach to participant selection. Children with autism, both those receiving treatment and those without any current treatment, were included in the study. There is no known neurological and uh, psychological diagnosis for the included children. To account for developmental differences, we organized the children into three distinct age groups. Group 1 comprised children aged between 2 and 5. Group 2 included children aged between 6 and 8. And group 3 consisted of children aged between 9 and 12. The collected signals underwent a pre-processing stage to enhance the quality of the data for subsequent analysis. For the blood volume plus data, a fixed order Chebyshev filter was applied. This filtering technique helps to remove unwanted noise and artifacts, ensuring that the BVP signal primarily reflects relevant to cardiovascular activity related to the study. The EDA signal was subjected a fifth order Savitz Eagle Light filter with a frame length of 11. This smoothing filter aids in reducing high frequency noise and fluctuations in the EDA signal while preserving the underlying physiological information. By applying this filter, we aim to enhance the clarity of the EDA data, enabling a more accurate analysis of the sympathetic nervous system responses associated with emotional arousal. In contrast, skin temperature signal required no specific preprocessing and was directly used for subsequent analysis. The EMBOA project, being a longitudinal study, involves multiple sessions conducted over time to gather comprehensive data. However, for the purposes of this particular study, only the first sessions were considered. This approach was taken to ensure a standardized methodology and avoid the potential influence of familiarization effects that may arise from repeated sessions. To capture relevant information from the physiological signals, a total of 80 features were extracted. In Table 2, a summary of the extracted features is presented. The signal denotes the Specific physiological signals under analysis, including blood volume pulse, electrodermal activity, skin conductance response, skin conductance level, and skin, temp skin temperature. The extracted features encompass a range of statistical measures to capture various aspects of the signal. These measures include the mean, median, standard deviation, minimum, maximum, pureness, and kurtosis of the signal. Considering these features, the study aimed to capture important statistical properties and patterns within the physiological signal, providing a comprehensive overview uh, of the participants' physiological responses. Our study consists of unsupervised feature selection steps. Unsupervised feature selection algorithms are techniques used to automatically identify and select relevant features from a dataset without relying on labeled target information. 
Let me briefly explain unsupervised uh, feature selection algorithms that we utilize. Various thresholding selects feature based on their variance. Each rules features with low variance is assuming they contain less useful information for the analysis. Mean absolute difference measures the average absolute difference between feature values. Selecting features with higher mean absolute differences as they exhibit greater variations. The Sparsity Ratio is an algorithm calculates the ratio between intercluster distance and the intracluster distance of the feature values. Features with higher dispersion ratios are considered more informative. Laplacian score assesses the locality structure of the data and selects features that preserve the local neighborhood information. Features with higher Laplacian scores are retained as they contribute more to the local structure. Distance-based entropy uh, evaluates the entropy of the feature values based on their pairwise distances. Features with higher entropy are selected as they possess greater dissimilarity among data points. Unsupervised discriminative feature selection aims to find features that maximize the discrepancy between data clusters while minimizing the redundancy within each cluster. It selects features that are both discriminative and independent within clusters. Non-negative discriminative uh, feature selection combines non-negative matrix factorization and the feature selection to identify informative features that can separate data points effectively. Multi-cluster feature selection selects features based on their ability to discriminate between multiple clusters. It aims to maximize the intercluster separability while minimizing the intra-cluster variance. These unsupervised feature selection algorithms provide automated approaches to identify relevant features without relying on labeled target information. They help reduce dimensionality, enhance computational efficiency, and improve interpretability and generalization of machine learning models. The investigation aimed to assess whether there were statistically significant differences in physiological signals among different age groups. One-way ANOVA tests were, tests were conducted, and the results indicated that certain features related to the amplitude range of the blood volume pulse signal were the most distinctive among the age groups. For electrodermal activity features, such as maximum uh, 95th uh, quantile, an amplitude range of SDR and SDR showed the significant differences between the age groups. The findings also suggest that age influences both the raw, cosmic, and tonic features of EDA. Among skin temperature features, 12 of, uh, out of uh, 16 were found to be statistically significant. Features related to variance in tricolor range and coefficient of variation did not show uh, significant differences across age groups. However, minimum, maximum, and range features for PEP, EDA, and ST signals were distinct among the three age groups. In summary, a subset of EVP, EDA, and ST features show statistically significant differences, with the ST signal being particularly distinctive between the age groups. An independent t test was conducted to compare the group means in pairwise comparisons. The results indicated that nine features showed significant differences between group one and group two. These significant features were primarily, primarily related to the minimum and maximum values of BVP and EVA signals, as well as the skewness of the SC's data distribution. When comparing group 1 and group 3, the significant differences were observed in the SD features. Additionally, when comparing group 2 and group 3, the significant differences were found in the EDA signal feature. In summary, the data from the youngest group differed significantly from the oldest group based on SD features, while the middle group, group 2, differed significantly from oldest group, group 3, based on the features extracted from the EDA signal. Please refer to table 
perform for detailed information uh, on the significant features and their respective comparisons. We present the results of an unsupervised feature selection analysis conducted on the three physiological signals. The most prominent features for each signal were identified, such as BVP minimum, BVP maximum, BVP range, and etc. as you see in the figure. The features were evaluated using a rating scheme based on their occurrence in the selection methods for each age group. Features with scores higher than 12 out of uh, 24 were considered significant, and the highest scores were BVP minimum and BVP range for BVP, SCR, standard deviation for EBA, and minimum SP or SP. The first aspect of our investigation focuses on analyzing physiological signals within different age groups. By examining signals such as blood volume pulse, electrodermal activity, and skin temperature, we aim to gain insights into how children's physiological responses vary across different developmental stages. Understanding these variations can help us identify specific patterns or markers associated with emotions emotions and stress in children. Next, we employ parametric statistical analysis techniques to examine the collected data. Specifically, we utilize methods such as one play on one and to compare means among different age groups. This allows us to determine if there are statistically significant differences in physiological responses between in the age groups. To further explore the distinctive features present in the physiological signals, we employ unsupervised feature selection algorithms. These algorithms autonomously identify relevant features without relying on labeled target information. Through these techniques, we aim to extract the most informative features. The investigation of age groups, parametric statistical analysis, and unsupervised feature selection holds significant implications for the field of child-robot interaction. By uncovering distinctive features from physiological signals, we can gain valuable insights into understanding children's emotions and stress during such interactions. This knowledge is vital for designing and developing child and their robots that can appropriately respond to and support children's emotional well-being. Future studies can leverage the findings to create more engaging and effective child-robot interaction experiences leading to improved social, cognitive, and emotional outcomes for children. Thank you for your attention, and I, I am open to any questions you may have. Um, okay, uh, are there any questions from the audience? No, are you able to hear me, Elif? Yes, I can hear okay. you now. I have a couple of curiosity. Um, first question uh, regards the fact that uh, uh, did you um, have done some uh, um, collinearity test to see that uh, um, actually there is the need of three sensors, so one for the uh, PPG, one for the, uh, the t skin temperature and so on. So this is the first. Second, in which way you um, want to employ these features for uh, developing a machine learning model? So to solve uh, which task? Um, uh, for second question, uh, we uh, want to uh, recognize the emotions and uh, stress detection for uh, these children. So uh, the task is uh, emotion recognition actually. And for the first question, no, uh, we didn't uh, do the culinary test. Okay. Thank you very much for your uh, work again. Uh, I, thank you. May I leave now? Thanks so.
Thanks again to all the audience to be here and uh, we finish the session now. Thank you again. Okay, we are finally here. We are starting the final ceremony of closing of CBMS 2023. Well, first of all, thank you to everybody for your participation. You're all here in this picture. And uh, this year we had more than 170 attendees, so in presence attendees, from about 37 countries all over, all over the world. So I think it's a big success. So thank you for all of you for uh, your participation and your contribution. Now, before going forward, we have some awards to assign, and uh, these are provided from the TCCLS, then I will briefly explain what it is. So, let me change presentation. So, TCCLS is the Technical Committee of uh, uh, Computational Life Sciences, is uh, inside IEEE, and it's also, um, it sponsorship, uh, sponsors um, the scientific conferences, also CBMS since long time, and you can join it for free. So, if you want, you can be part of this committee. Um, this year, it offered uh, seven awards, uh, five are uh, student travel awards, and uh, two are best paper awards, okay? And uh, we adopted uh, the methodology you see for evaluation, and the committee is listed uh, below. And we select a pool of candidates from according to the reviewer scores, and then we evaluated the presentation during the conference. Uh, we evaluated uh, the Q&A, the content, the methodology, and so on. So, without any further uh, waiting, let's go and see who are the winners of the awards. For the Student Travel Awards, we have as first winner the, the paper Increasing the Diversity of Ensemble Members for Accurate Brain Tumor Classification. So, winner over there. <laughs> um, then development of a breast ultrasound phantom for medical training. So another applause to the winner. Third one is towards realistic 3D ultrasound synthesis, deformable augmentation using conditional variational autoencoders. Then a lightweight CNN model for efficient Parkinson's disease diagnostics. <laughs> and finally, uh, anti-seizure medication classification using EEG signals via attention-based CNN. Congratulations uh, to all of you. Uh, you will receive uh, uh, communication from the TCCLS chair for the certificate and for the award, of course. Okay? Then it's not finished because we have two uh, TC sponsored best paper awards. And the first one to win is Structuring Breast Cancer Spanish Electronic Health Records Using Deep Learning. And the second one to win is telemonitoring using augmented reality, a feasibility study to assess teaching of laparoscopic suturing skills. Thank you very much and congratulations to the winners and as above, uh, as I said earlier, you will receive also for this communication directly from the TCCLS chair and uh, for the award, for the uh, um, uh, certificate for the award. Okay, let's go back to the closing. <coughs> mm -hmm. 
Further to this, uh, as you saw on the website, we have two special issues. So for selected papers that we receive communications about their uh, possibility to publish an extended version in these two um, high quality journals. And uh, um, in the next days, you will, we will publish in the web page a selection of the best pictures and uh, that were taken during the conference. Also, don't, con don't uh, go out to Slack so quickly because m maybe I will send some further communications to you <laughs> um, the, over there. And um, we will also send you a survey, of course, to, uh, to, to see your feedback uh, on this edition of CBMS and to improve the, the new one. Then, about the next edition, I'll leave the floor to Alejandro. So, uh, well, you can uh, just open the, the video. Well, the next edition will be in Mexico, in Guadalajara, in the next year. So, nice place, I think. Hello, this is uh, Gilberto Ochoa Ruiz, uh, Associate <laughs> Professor in Tecnológico Monterrey. <laughs> Well, as I was saying, <laughs> it will be in Mexico, in Guadalajara, and now I will leave the floor virtual to this video made by Gilberto, which be, uh, will be one of the, of the general chairs, and, and he will explain uh, everything. Saldi, he is not here, so for this reason we have a, a recorded video also, because right now in Mexico it's like probably the 7 in the morning, and I, don't th I think that probably he prefers to sleep. So, Rosa, when you want. Hello. This is uh, Gilberto Ochoa Ruiz, uh, Associate Professor in Tecnológico Monterrey and one of the general chairs of the International Conference in Computer Based Mechanical Systems. I'm going to present you the, uh, the Sono Diaz of the organization that is going to take place in Guadalajara, Mexico next year, um, and a little bit of the organization. So, Guadalajara is a very important city located in the west of Mexico, uh, very well known for its uh, cultural heritage for the driving tech sector. And in this presentation, I will talk a little bit about the allocation of Guadalajara, travel information, and so on, a little, a little bit about the uh, organization committee. Uh, Guadalajara is very well located. We have tra travels to many different places, uh, mainly in the US, and a little bit in some parts of uh, South America. But you can come here uh, from Los Angeles, Dallas, Houston, some other cities, and there is a direct flight to uh, Barcelona, Madrid, and Madrid. So, the, the, the airport is located about 45 minutes from, from Guadalajara, so it's not very far. Uh, we're going to organize um, the conference in Tecnológico Monterrey Campus Guadalajara, which is one of Tecnológico Monterrey is one of the most important uh, universities in Mexico, and Guadalajara is one of the main campuses. Uh, and we're expecting uh, between 200 and 300 participants. Uh, uh, we are organizing the conference from June 26 to June 28, 2024. Uh, something of note is that uh, Guadalajara has been uh, declared one of the most interesting cities for, by uh, Time magazine because of its vibrant cultural life, the gastronomical importance, the Bojan uh, LGBTQ uh, community, and the attra uh, attractions around the city, like Tequila, which is a very important uh, destination here. Uh, the campus Guadalajara is a relatively large campus uh, with many amenities, uh, restaurants, and we have a, a very big congress center here. Um, uh, that the campus can be reachable by three different bus lines. We have about 30,000 students, but by the time you come here, the most of the students will be vacations. Uh, we have bachelor degrees like biomedical engineering, and many, among many others. And uh, we have a master and PhD programs in computer science. Uh, the venue uh, is about, we have this very large uh, uh, Congress Center, the boat for the capacity of 22,000 persons. Uh, we have six ex ex executive calls to auditoriums for the uh, big or the, for the keynote speakers. And uh, we have many restaurants and cafeterias on campus. Uh, also, uh, you can reach the, the, the Tech in Monterrey by bus or by CBT or by Uber. Uh, it's not very expensive. And um, the main, most of the hotels are about 20 minutes from here, but we are planning to uh, accommodate uh, buses and shuttles to take you to Tech in Monterrey and back to the hotel. Uh, so man, there are many prices, many different uh, accommodation options here from different kind of uh, budgets. So now, for example, we have Haro Cafe, or we have the Rio Hotel, which is very nice. I mean, different accommodations in the city with really nice views, and the weather is just exceptional by the time you come here. Um, 
And usually uh, the rain season is from June to September, but the uh, temperature is quite nice. Uh, we have very uh, sunny pl uh, places and many places, uh, many uh, different uh, places to go and visit. Uh, also, the food here in Guadalajara is very well known. Uh, we have very traditional food, different options, even uh, vegetarian options, of course, and, and many different traditional dishes. Uh, there are many attractions around the city, like, um, uh, for example, uh, many places around uh, the city, like half an hour distance. Like, for example, we have Tequila, which is, uh, where, as we call them here in Mexico, a magical town, uh, in which you can visit the town itself. But there are so many distilleries in which they produce tequila, and you can also see the very famous agave landscape. It's basically all this landscape with agave plants, and you can go uh, do some tequila tasting and visit the town. It is quite nice. Uh, there is also a train. Uh, that you can take from Guadalajara to uh, to Tequila with the Marechi band and so on. They are very nice experience. We also have uh, the largest uh, lake in Mexico, which is called Chapala. It's a small town on this lake, uh, and it's about uh, half an hour from Guadalajara. It's a very well-known town, uh, just uh, by the lake site. It's called Ajijic, which is a very nice place to visit with nice music and nice restaurants. Uh, we also have Tlaquipaque, which is a town which they sell this kind of pottery and many different activities, and you can see galleries and listen to mariachi music and so on. And also, well, here is very well known for the uh, cultural life, like the murals done by this uh, very famous uh, Mexican artist, Colorosco. So you can also visit uh, these places that are spread around the city, and you can, uh, you can appreciate those murals. Also, you are more interested in uh, commercial stuff. We have the Andalus Financial District and many boutiques like in, uh, in this area. Or you can visit a very uh, interesting and nice Colonia Americana in which you have many bars and bistros, both from traditional Mexican food and international food as well. Um, and um, I just want to close a little bit with the organizational logistics. Uh, at this, as you know, this conference needs a, of a committee to take care of it. So I will, I will chair it along the Enrico Grisan from London South Bank University in the United Kingdom. Uh, as program chair, a lot of local chair, we have some colleagues from Hinter Tech Monterrey, Mauricio Interviz, uh, Rita Fuentes Aguilera, Salvador Hinojosa. And from the program committee, we have my colleague Charlie Balit uh, from the University of Leeds in the United Kingdom. We have Rosa Sicilia from the University Campus and Anastasia Kritara from uh, Greece. Uh, we also put together uh, more uh, some other colleagues from, both, uh, from Mexico and around the world from the CMBS uh, Steering Committee. So we try to uh, strive right for diversity. So we have women and, and, and men in equal uh, measure. And uh, we have people from government and industry that will try to make this a very, a very good experience for you. Uh, we also put together people from a lot of people from Latin America, uh, from different um, communities to help us make this even a success. So we are really looking for you to, to come and join us here in Mexico, which I think is, uh, especially Guadalajara, is quite a nice uh, city. And I actually from here from Guadalajara. I'm looking forward to meet you here, to take you around to these very nice places and to organize a very successful conference. Uh, so see you around. Uh, this, um, this is my contact information. And we're expecting your submissions uh, for this uh, very nice conference. Thank you a lot. Uh, have a nice day. And uh, as I mentioned again, I'm looking uh, forward to, to see you here in Mexico. Have a nice day. So. I think that Gilberto did a really uh, good job in terms of tourist attraction because he said a lot of things uh, from Guadalajara. But uh, I think that will be really a, ni a nice place to, to have uh, CBMS. So I hope that uh, you can join us in, in the next year edition. And uh, from my side, nothing else, Giuseppe. Sorry, just a few words for, to, for acknowledgement to you. And uh, let me say that uh, next year we came from L'Aquila to Tequila City. <laughs> so almost the same. <laughs> I, I see that. Yes, it's nice. Then I, I want to uh, acknowledge and thank you, Rosa and uh, Alejandro, for the. Uh, uh, very, very beautiful company. And uh, the program chair, uh, Joao, Mira, Mayra, and uh, Jose Alberto, the businessman. The business yes, businessman. <laughs> business. 
And uh, also, I, I would like to thank you, Matteo Posinelli, who is the financial chair, is very worried for, for the budget, but uh, <laughs> it doesn't matter. And <laughs> it's not a problem. Obviously, I want, I want to thank you, all of you, and I hope you enjoyed L'Aquila and the conference here, and I thank you warmly for your presence here. And uh, final, uh, finally, but not least important, I want to share the scene with uh, the local chair and all the guys that uh, helped to, to reach these results that, this year. And uh, please come here and take a picture and, uh, uh, with, with us, for example, Alessandro, Matteo, Matteo. Alessandro is Di Matteo. Matteo is Matteo, Matteo, Matteo. <laughs> all are Matteo. Uh, Daniele. Uh, and, and all the, the other local, local chair that have been here these days. Filippo, come here. Alessandro. Eleni? Where is Eleni? Thank you to everyone. And uh, I hope that uh, next year we'll, be, uh, we'll see in uh, Guadalajara, right? In, in Tequila City. <laughs> Thank you again.